Many years ago, my family was getting back from vacation. And when we got home, my brother took the car and headed out with his girlfriend. Since we had just gotten home from a long trip, my mother decided to do a load of laundry. She began heading upstairs with a small basket of clothes. And as she left the laundry room, she saw a tall, dark figure standing at the end of the hallway. Terrified, she ran upstairs, and as soon as she reached the top step, she got a call. My brother had gotten into an accident, and the ambulance was on the way. A few days later, after surgery and some recovery, my brother and his girlfriend were talking to us about what happened, and he said, Mom, I saw you at the crash. Confused, my mom asked what he meant. He said, Mom, I saw you at the end of the hallway. You had the laundry basket in your hands. The night my brother crashed, he rolled his car down a hill and blacked out for a moment with a concussion. He crawled out of the car. His girlfriend ran to him and hugged him. He didn't remember where he was till he heard the ambulance heading down the road. As he turned his head to look at it, his already broken neck gave out and he was resuscitated at the scene. He was dead for almost a full minute. At that time, he went home and saw my mom describing the clothes, the hair, and the laundry she was holding. It was insane. He made a full recovery and hasn't crashed a car since. It was the night of a party of some sort, and my sisters had a few friends over. We were all getting them ready to go out. We were in the hall bathroom, and my sister's room, which had a full mirror, was directly across the hall from the bathroom. Suddenly, my sister's friend glanced down the hallway and saw an older woman in an old-fashioned black dress, with a tight grey bun on top of her head. The reflection of the woman sitting at our dining room table was so clear, she got curious as to who it was. So she walked down the hallway and looked into the kitchen to see no one. All the chairs were empty, except a coat hanging across the back of a chair. She got all of our attention, and from the end of the hall, we looked into the TV's reflection, and we tried to figure out if the shape was just from the coat. That's when we saw her head move. And we all screamed. Our mother ran out of her room, and we explained what was happening. She looked down the hall, and she too saw the woman. She walked into the kitchen with caution, and we directed her towards the woman in the reflection. Very carefully, she inched closer till her hand was inches away. Carefully, she grabbed on. But before she could even push the chair, the figure had disappeared, leaving an empty space in the reflection. There was no possible way that the figure was the same coach that we now could see clearly. We all were so scared from that point that we all finished getting ready in my sister's room. We turned the TV around and the next day we moved the TV to a different place in the room. We didn't want to risk seeing her again if we were alone and freaking ourselves out. This woman became popular at our home and there are many other stories involving her. She's known as Gertrude to us, the lonely lady in black. When I was little, I was constantly being bullied by others because I was different. It was both physical and mental bullying by kids, teachers, adults around me and my siblings. It got so bad that I tried to kill myself at eight years old. I had two friends and even they were distant towards me when others were around. At six years old, I began to be alone all the time and I began hearing voices and seeing people who became my friends. My parents, assuming I had created imaginary friends to cope with being alone, went along with it. In the middle of summer, I had gotten very close with my friend, and we had played many games together, and spoken about things going on. And that was when things began to get weird. She had started to talk to me about things that hadn't happened yet. Coming to me in the middle of the night, opening my closet door while everyone slept and sat on the edge of my bed. I shared a bunk bed with my sister, and she always slept on the top bunk. She never woke up any time she came to the room, no matter how loud we were. After talking to her for a while, 
she began to talk to me about how my mom was going to fall down the stairs, or my brother would break a bone, or that my plate would shatter and cut someone, and it got scary. I would tell people to be careful so as to avoid these things, but no one took me seriously, and they would still get hurt. One day, she told me she needed me to do something for her. She needed me to lead her with my body, and she touched me for the first time. Her skin was hot and cold at the same time. If I felt like she had burnt me, then put ice over it, and then sent shivers down my body, causing me to become temporarily paralyzed, and I screamed, waking my parents up and causing her to run into the dark closet to disappear. And that's when I began to tell my family about her, about her nightly visits and the things she would tell me and how she touched me. My mother decided to call a medium. Without telling the woman a single thing, she immediately came to me and asked me about things she should not have known about and began telling me to tell the girl that she was not allowed to be here and that I don't give her permission to be in my house and be near us and I wasn't her friend and she needed to leave. And I did, that night. She came to my room and told me how angry she was, that I told everyone about her and that she was supposed to be a secret. And that's when I told her I didn't want her around and that she was scaring me and I needed her to leave and never come back. And she laughed at me, giving me chills and leaving an eerie feeling. She walked up to my face and said, fine, I will leave. And she grew tall and as she walked into the closet darkness, swallowed the whole doorway and slowly receded till it was back to normal. For the first time in months, I slept great and wasn't scared. I felt relieved. For a week or so, everything went great. Until one night, I got up to go to the bathroom. Walking into the hallway, I found that the bathroom light didn't turn on. Headed back to my room, I found the door closed and locked along with the other rooms in the hallway. I looked back and I saw a dark shape move in the bathroom and dread took over my body. I began to panic, pounding on the doors in the hall but getting no answer. Trying to open the doors and staring straight ahead, fearing that I would see shadows if I turned around. And after a while, I gave up, sinking down to the floor and placing my head on my knees. I began to hear whispers, echoing from the hall. I peeked up and looked around and saw a dark, looming figure peering down the hall, and slowly it stalked toward me. I screamed and buried my head into my knees once again, just waiting for the figure to get me. But it never did. Instead, I heard my brother's voice as he wrapped his arm around me. I looked up to see his face full of dread as he asked how long I was sitting there. I told him everything and he gently knocked on my parents' bedroom door, waking them and telling them everything that had happened and how he had heard me screaming as he was walking up the stairs to the kitchen and came running. For the next week, I slept in my parents' bedroom and one night I was woken up to a slight creaking noise. Looking over, I saw the closet door opening and then she appeared and slowly walked over and leaned over me, pinning me down and paralyzing me. I couldn't scream and I couldn't move. She sat over me as if waiting for the perfect moment and that's when my mom moved next to me. And I got the chance to scream. It woke my mom up and she looked over, she saw it. The thing I saw as a little girl was the dark figure from the hallway and she was speechless. She was trying to wake my father as it slowly inched its face closer to mine and finally he shot up alerting it and causing it to leave. Finally, I could move. It was over from there. I was then baptized and we moved houses. Back in 1997, I was asked by my manager to help him move out of his mom's old house. I figured as long as I'm getting paid, no problem. I knew she had died and him being the oldest son was taking care of her at the house. He was a man in his 50s, so his mother had been living in the house since the late 50s to 60s, by the look of the stuff. I was to bring out the stuff from the bedrooms into the large living room, and then he would tell me what went in the truck and what went in the garage. I would take out everything from the bedroom, then sort the closet. In every bedroom, I would do that, 
I would turn from the closet and step on something that had not been there before, like a toy car or rolling pin. There was a box in the living room next to the phone, and I could feel some very unwelcoming vibes coming from it. In the third bedroom, he wanted me to take the side tables the box was laying on in the garage. I did and asked where you want the box. He said just put it over there on the couch. He did and cleared the third bedroom on the way out of the closet. I looked around and didn't see anything to trip on. I carried two boxes and tripped on a broom that had been placed at the doorway out of room. This was his mom's room and I fell flat on my face on top of the boxes because I did see it carrying the boxes. I had to now move the couch into the garage and put the box on the floor in front of the fireplace. I was almost done and my manager was cleaning out the kitchen all this time. I was working fast now because the feeling of dread was getting to me. I had one closet left in the living room. When I turned with the box I almost fell because I had stepped on a rotten banana on the floor behind me. I asked my manager pretty angry at this point if he had placed it there. He was a serious older man and was like you're kidding right? I was like forget it. I was done took the last things into the garage and moving truck. I stopped and asked him where the box by the fireplace went. It was the last thing in the house. He said mom goes in the garage. She left the house to my brother so he can take her. I picked it up and sure enough, it was the LA corner marked ashes and had a woman's name. I thought to myself, why you wanted me gone so badly? You probably don't know you're gone. I placed her in the garage and was very happy to be leaving. A year after high school, I went to spend the night at a friend's house. It was the first time I had thought I had visited a few times beforehand. We were going to drive somewhere early the next morning. He had in the past told me that his house was haunted but I had never experienced something like that outside of my own home. After dinner with his family, we went into his backyard with his pit bull. It wasn't aggressive, but was somewhat trained to be, if needed, as a guard dog. As we sat in the yard, the dog began to sniff around his fence that was covered deeply with ivy. We both turned to look when it started to growl. Next thing we knew, the rather heavy dog flew back ten feet or so and came running at us like a scared pup. We figured it was some kind of animal and the dog had jumped back, but the way it flew, I had my doubts. It was as if someone had thrown it back, but there was no scurrying or noise in the fence. We poked at the fence with broomsticks and nothing. The dog went in the house and would not come out. It was still light out and my friend proceeded to tell me that things had been going on the past few months. His uncle had died and there were strange things going on in the house. We opened the door to the garage where his uncle would stay when we lived there. It was summer in LA and quite warm, but in the garage you could see your breath and the light would only go in a foot or two. We closed the door and when it got late, I slept on the living room couch. That night, I awoke to the clear sound of boots walking up and down the hallway. I was freezing and figured it was best to keep my eyes closed. I felt inside that this was not a person. I drifted back to sleep eventually. In the morning, I told my friend and he said that was my uncle. He then told me how he had died. He had been arrested for being a bad drunk at a party and was fighting with everyone, including the police that came. He had hung himself in jail with shoelaces, despite the fact that he was wearing cowboy boots. This was not uncommon back then. People died in custody all the time. When his father got home, he told him, and that hard no bullshit man, told me he had seen his nephew outside his window once, with a look on his face like he was pleading for forgiveness. This was the first paranormal experience I had outside my house. I never spent the night there again. I can't really say why I did this. I know it wasn't really for my health. After night classes at a tech school, my friend and I had time. We got out about 10 and in those years, this was early. He asked if there were any tracks open to jog in. 
Burbank was too far, and I told him I knew a place. I had been taken the year prior by a friend that liked local anomalies. I drove to the hills where the 210 and 118 meet. In the hills, maybe 15 minutes in there is a graveyard called Glen Haven. According to my other friend, the year prior, it was very haunted. It has no walls and it's across the street from another graveyard that does have fencing. Down the road from it there is a gravity hill that pushes your car uphill. Down further there is a bar that had people that would chase you out if you were not their type of person. At the end of the way out, you bump a walkway that goes under the 210 freeway. Supposedly, someone was killed there and you can hear the screaming if you go to it in the middle of at night. The gravity hill is real. The bar is always closed when I've gone and I heard the screaming at the walkway but can see it being an echo. But the graveyard. Me and my friend walked out and I told him we could run across and back for exercise. After some debate, I told him it was forced conditioning. We would be compelled not to stop until we got back. I did not know how right I was. By then, it was almost 11pm and we started our run. I started to hear a little girl giggling. As we continued, because there were no lights in or around the graveyard, I could see what looked like fireflies. They're not native to Southern California, at least I've never seen them there. We started detecting movement by the time we reached the other side, and started running back almost in a panic. By this time, we could fully hear footsteps behind us, and both of us refused to turn around. When we jumped off the curve onto the road, it all stopped. The whole place went silent. It scared the hell out of us. On the way back, I said no one better chase us. I'm not in the mood. We did this once a week with the same results for a month. After that, we found something else to do that was less frightening. Being macho, we were like, that's boring. But we were really scared. I can admit that now. Early in my work repairing police cars, we had a strange few days. I was working in a huge repair facility, repairing police cars. We had a vehicle get towed in filled with blood and brains on the driver's seat and floor. They wanted us to drive it in so we could remove bullets in the engine compartments. We refused to drive it in and the policeman that worked there put plastic on the seats and drove it in. It took a few hours to dismantle the car until we found all the bullets. After that, they just left the car there in our shop. I inquired about moving it, but they said no, just leave it. We did get a story about it. The quick version is that a suspect bushed the officer on the floor, ran into the car and tried to run him down. The officer discharged his weapon and one round took him in the head. After they left the vehicle almost pulsed with negative angry energy. The whole mood of the shop was dark. At lunch, a motorcycle fell off the repair lift. Something that hadn't happened before or since. An hour after that, a tow truck came out of a part as the RPM were running high because the PTO was being used. It ran in reverse for 150 yards through our large parking lot and hit a box truck at about 30 miles an hour, 15 feet from the motorcycle lift that had failed. The mood kept getting darker. At the end, the mechanics were asking if they could put religious candles around the car I told them no, we can't have open flames in the shop. When the time came to close, it was just me and the later shift mechanic. When I walked the floor, the solvent tank's light bulbs were blinking throughout the shop. We were very uneasy, and as I approached the car in question, I could see flickering reflected on the window of the car next to it. In that reflection, I could see someone kneeling near the source of the flickering. I got angry and started yelling. I told you guys, no candles. When I and the mechanic next to me turned the corner, there was nothing. No man, no candle, nothing. I told the mechanic, let's get the hell out of here. Closed the shop and left. The car was there for three days with minor incidents, but mostly we stayed away from it. When they took the car, it was like night and day. When I first saw the movie Grudge, I thought to myself, yeah, I can see that happening. Enraged death can stain things.
In the year and a half I was assigned to work at a police station in West Hollywood, I saw many strange things, but most of them were for different forums than this. I had contact with trustees and they would talk briefly from time to time, but I was working for most of the day. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically prisoners that are non-violent and have small sentences that live in the station doing menial jobs. One day, one comes up to me and says that he could not sleep because there was thumping in the bathroom next to their dorm. I was like, most pipes, just deal with it. I went back to work. After the weekend, I saw him and he looked very tired. He told me that the thumping continued and he could hear gagging quietly. He went into the bathroom and no one was there and the noise stopped. The days would pass and now several of them were looking not rested. They said they can all hear it. I said, mention it to the person in charge of you. He told me that they did and they threatened to get sent to regular prison if they kept bothering him. Sounded typical, but I was feeling kind of bad as they were looking kind of scared and tired. When I ran into the person in charge of them, he said that that complaint came up every now and then, but there was nothing they could do. Everyone knew that five years prior, a trustee hung himself in that bathroom while everyone was sleeping. The problem would solve itself when the scared prisoners asked to be sent back to regular prison. There was nothing I could do, so I decided not to tell them because nothing good would come of it. They were all gone by the next week and their replacement must have been heavy sleepers because I didn't hear anything about it after that. Back in 1997, I lived in what I would call a bad neighbourhood. It was in the San Fernando Valley, so it was not the worst LA had to offer. The apartment was under the stairs halfway to the back. The rent was cheaper than the other apartments, and I was glad to have gotten it. It was just me and my girlfriend at the time living there. What was odd off the bat was that I had two steps from the door to the floor of the apartment. I do not know why, and it was the only one. What it did do was make it cooler, almost all the time despite the outside temp. The kitchen and living room were open to each other, and the door led to the bedroom. You could see 80% of the apartment from the bedroom. The first odd thing that happened was that at night, I could hear someone walking around outside my door and then knock. Sometimes I was in the living room and could clearly see no one was out there. A few weeks, the TV or radio would turn on, then the volume would go up. At the time, I figured that someone had similar electronics and that was causing it. It wasn't until a drawer came open in the kitchen and something fell on the floor late one night. It was my knife drawer and the chef's knife was on the floor. I was in my bedroom and could see across the apartment and no one had been there. I started asking the neighbours but they mostly wanted to keep to themselves. The next night I woke up to quiet sobbing that stopped when I went into the living room. The next day I struck up a conversation with an older resident. I asked about my apartment and he smiled. He told me a few years back there were some gang members that lived there. They used to make noise and trouble and everyone stayed away from them. One day, they got in a fight in the apartment and stabbed someone to death. They just up and left him there and it took a week or so to call the police when it started smelling. They couldn't get the smell out because it was in the subfloor. The solution was to tear it out and carpet and tile the cement under it. Looking at the rough cement one foot around the whole apartment, it made sense. He then told me there's more. I was like, great. The next people who lived there had a teenage daughter and she had a boyfriend in the building. They broke up later and he would watch her come and go with hate in his eyes. Luckily for him, he didn't hurt her physically, but what he did do was hang himself on the stairs just outside her door looking at it. He knew she left for work early and of course she found him. Later I talked to the lady that lived in the apartment where her dead boyfriend lived. And she said she could hear someone opening her door, then walk down the walkway towards my apartment. I didn't renew my lease after a year of ghosts and the actually dangerous gang member that lived in these apartments. My family and I lived on post at Fort Campbell, Kentucky for eight years. The first house we lived in there was seriously haunted. 
Shortly after we moved in, the odd occurrences started. The first one I can remember was about three months or so after we moved in. Our youngest daughter was two and her toy box set was up in a hallway that ran from our dining room to the front door. With our stairs acting as a wall and separator from our living room. I was playing on my phone and she was on the other side of the stairs playing with her toys. Suddenly, I hear her come running through the hallway and into the living room. When I looked up at her, there was no way to describe her other than terrified. Her eyes were wide with fear and she ran as fast as she could to jump onto the couch with me. When I asked what was wrong, she pointed to the hallway and said, that man scare me. My blood ran cold. We were the only two at home. My husband was at work and my older daughter was at school. So there definitely should not have been any man in my house. When I asked what man, she just kept pointing to the hallway and saying, that man over there. I grabbed a small wooden bat from a toy bin at the end of our couch and crept into the hallway. There was no one there. I carefully walked around the entire first floor, searching the storage space under our stairs, our laundry room and our pantry. No one there. No one could have snuck upstairs without me hearing. The old wooden stairs in our home were notoriously creaky and the door leading to our garage was also very loud. There was no way anyone could have gotten out of the living areas without me hearing them. I was officially freaked out and told my husband about it as soon as the kids went to bed that night. He chalked it up to our daughter's vivid imagination. The second weird occurrence happened a few weeks later. My husband was a soldier in the army and after physical training in the morning, he would come home to shower and change into his uniform for the day. He was taking a shower in our bathroom when he thought he saw someone walking through our bedroom. Our shower curtain had a clear panel across the top and he showered with the door open because of poor ventilation in the bathroom. From the doorway of the bathroom, you had a clear view of our bedroom. He said out of the corner of his eye, he had seen someone walk up next to our bed and bend over our nightstand. But when he asked me about it, I told him I had never come upstairs. He was weirded out and thought maybe he imagined it. We ended up getting a dog shortly after. Our beautiful bulldog was named Eleanor. And unfortunately, soon after getting her, we learned that our youngest daughter was deathly allergic to her. Because of our daughter's allergies, Eleanor had to stay downstairs and at night we would kennel her in our dining room. It wasn't long that she began to bark at the hallway. The same hallway my daughter had claimed to see a man that scared her. Eleanor's hair on the back of her neck would stand up and she would bark at something we couldn't see. At first, we thought maybe it would be mice, despite no other signs that we had them. We set traps and never caught anything. We ended up having to rehome our sweet Eleanor due to my daughter's allergies. But for the entire two years we had her, she hated that hallway and would refuse to walk through it. The most terrifying event that ever happened to me when we lived in that house was the night I saw him. I was laying in bed playing on my phone while my husband slept beside me. It was around 1am and I decided I needed to try to get some sleep since I'd have to get my oldest up for school the following morning. I'd been facing our bathroom and the door to our bedroom. I rolled over to snuggle up to my husband and standing in the corner of our room was a soldier in full uniform. The room was dark, but because of a street lamp right outside the window, he was illuminated well. I screamed and smacked my husband to wake up. And as soon as my husband jumped, the soldier took one step toward the bed and disappeared into thin air. I was hysterical. My husband told me I had to have been dreaming, but I had never been to sleep and I knew what I saw. He had been so solid I would have sworn he was a real person until he faded away right before my eyes. I was terrified and it took me forever to fall asleep. The next day, I talked to a friend of mine who had lived on our street for a few years. At first, I simply asked if she had ever heard of anyone else on post complaining about their house being haunted. She said yes and asked why. I didn't tell her what I saw, but I did tell her that weird stuff had been happening in our house. She immediately got uncomfortable and said, well, you know a guy that used to live on our street killed himself in his house, right? I was shocked. I said no and asked her when it happened. 
She explained that when she and her husband first moved in, they used to have block parties in the cul-de-sac at the end of our street. Shortly after they moved in, they went to a block party to meet the neighbours and someone at the party told them it was a good thing that they hadn't moved in a few months earlier because one of the neighbours had committed suicide after returning home from war. They said he had suffered from PTSD and shot himself one night. With it being a military post, it had really shaken up the whole neighbourhood. My friend wasn't sure exactly which house it happened in, but judging from what we had all seen and experienced in my house, I was sure it was mine. We had tons of other experiences in that house. We lived there for six of the eight years we lived at Fort Campbell. And there was always something weird or unexplainable happening there. I share a room with my grandma and I'm not sleeping there because she's sick. That's why I was sleeping on our living room sofa. I've slept on that sofa at night lots of times, so I wasn't scared or anything. The actual story is I was on my phone and I had a really bad gut feeling. So I stopped scrolling on my phone and was trying to sleep. After a minute, I heard someone singing a song behind me. It was coming from another sofa that was behind me. It was just for a few seconds, but I got so scared and pretended to be asleep. And I don't know how I managed to stay calm for so long. After 15 minutes, my mum came to get water from the kitchen, and I finally got up and went straight to their room. When I told them they laughed at me, but of course anyone would laugh, I knew they weren't going to believe me. I know it wasn't my family, because grandma and my brother are asleep upstairs. My parents' room is downstairs, but not near the living room. I know I heard it, but if it was real, then what was it? This house we live in is our ancestral home. But no one ever experienced anything paranormal in the house, except for my brother and I. My other experience was a month ago. I was brushing my teeth, then I heard something, and then I saw something sprint past me. First I thought it was my brother, and then I remembered he was still asleep. And also when I told this to my parents, they laughed and didn't believe me. But I think they were trying to convince me that it was just in my head, because they've experienced these things themselves. I don't know about my dad but my mom was nervously laughing. Me and my roommate just moved to our new apartment. It's been like a month. Since the first few days, weird things started happening. Like I started finding my hat inside the sleeve of my jacket multiple times in the first few days. I never put it there, nor did my roommate. Things started falling and doors opening by themselves. But the house is old and we are moving, so we thought nothing of it. Burned some Palo Santo and thought that was it. Then my girlfriend came to visit and she told me she woke up in the middle of the night, feeling like something horrible was behind her and watching us sleep. I brushed it off as sleep paralysis, but then I too started to wake up, always around 4am. Always feeling like I've been woken up. My roommate sometimes hears what sounds like pebbles falling on the floor. My roommate too wakes up around the same hours and feels watched. But the thing is, we didn't tell her what happened to my girlfriend and neither did I about waking up so abruptly in the middle of the night. So we aren't conditioning each other. Then the dreams and smells and bruises started. Sometimes something in the house smells like pure death, but it obviously is not anything we can find and the dog doesn't look for it, so it's not like garbage or food, just a smell so foul and rotten. We wake up bruised, pretty badly, in points where we can't have caused it, not even without realising, and the bruises on me have become really big through time. And then, then nightmares. It's since I was a child that I hadn't had dreams that bad. So realistic and lucid, and I always remember them clearly. And it's always something really atrocious. So when I was younger, around the age of 10 years old, we visited for the third time in my life and the first time I remembered clearly, my grand aunt Eugenia's house in Aegeo, Greece. This time was the first we visited and she wasn't with us anymore. She had passed away. That summer, I remember it very vividly, 
because I had constant dreams of her visiting me and lighting up the holy candle that was hanging over my bed at night. It was something she used to do when we were visiting because at the time there was faulty wiring in my room so we didn't use any of the plugs and the candlelight also worked as a nightlight so I wouldn't stumble on any furniture at night when I got up to use the bathroom. Usually after those dreams I would wake up to find the holy candle lit or slowly going out since it was morning. That summer was also the first summer I was allowed to explore the neighbourhood with my five-year-old sister but not as far as we would have liked. But one evening, my dad and my aunt Helena had a fight, and when dad gets angry, he leaves and goes for long walks. It's something he does to calm himself down. That evening, I heard the fight, and I wanted to console him, so I quickly ran after him. We walked around the neighbourhood in our PJs and flip-flops, as we enjoyed the sunset and the sea view we had, as we talked about various things about the night. On our way back home, after my mum called my dad, we passed the house on 39th Constantinopolia Street. I remember it looked so jarringly familiar that I froze before it, and my dad unknowingly kept pulling as we were holding hands. I didn't know why it looked so familiar, so I pushed that memory aside. Years go by and it's 2018, and we're visiting the house again. This time, I've had an anxiety attack that was so bad that mum suggested I remove myself from the house. Where was the thing that caused me my anxiety, aka my phone and social media? And I listened to her, left my phone, wore my shoes and I left the house. Just as I was trying to shut the door in my frantic state, dad stopped me, saying I shouldn't be alone now, so we tagged along. We walked the same route as all those years ago. My anxiety attack slowly faded away and we sat by a bench enjoying the sunset when I finally calmed down completely. On our way back, I saw the house again, and this time I was sure it looked familiar, because I had seen it in a dream, yet I couldn't pinpoint the dream. I would visit this house many more times during the summer of 2018 and 2019, trying to take my mind to recall the dream. It was summer of 2020 when I was talking on the phone, and since on the street we have better cell phone signals, I was pacing around the neighbourhood when I had music coming from down the street. Now, keep in mind, this neighbourhood is located above nightclubs, and it was summer. Music is always present, either by the nightclubs or because many of the houses in the area are summer houses, and everyone has windows open. But this music didn't fit in. It sounded like it was coming from a gramophone. While listening to my friend rambling, I started following the music, and the moment I stopped before the house, the music stopped. I jumped when I heard the sound of a glass breaking that came from the balcony of a house next to the one I was staring at. I shook my head, thinking again that it came from a different house, and the sound just spread out. Summer 2021, I'm walking down the same path with my dad, as a leisure walk this time, and we're discussing architecture of the early 20th century, when dad stops before the very same house and points out how the house looks old, but the terrace looks relatively new, maybe 1950s. That was when I automatically corrected him, saying that the terrace is older, but the renovation might have been around the 1950s. He looked at me confused, wondering how I knew that, but I just shrugged and pointed lamely that the brick that the whole house was covered in was exactly the same, but the railings were different. If they hadn't stored the bricks to use later, it must have been built all at the same time. Dad gave up after that, saying that I was right, and we kept walking. As we were walking, a small breeze blew, and I heard the gramophone music again. That was the moment I remembered the dream. The dream was of me watching some young girls around the early 1900s, walking towards that house, as music from the house was able to be heard all the way down the street. I didn't know who those ladies were, but they were in their late 17 years old, with early 20s. I watched them entering the house that looked in very good condition, not as abandoned as I grew up watching it in real life. I remember I followed those girls inside the house, where that there was a party happening. That was when I realised the time period. It was a send-off party. The eldest son of the household was going to fight World War I, and all his friends and family 
threw him a party to say goodbye. They were quite rich, judging by how the house was decorated. I remember watching a couple in that terrace looking at the sky and talking about how fragile life is and that when the war ends, the man would marry the girl. And the girl told him not to make promises he can't keep because life is unexpected. After that, I felt myself being pulled back and I found myself watching the house and this time I saw my grandma and great aunt Eugenia standing outside of it holding each other's arms and I wanted to yell out to them to say hi. And I was there when I realised they couldn't see me. I had nobody. I was just watching everything. Judging by how old my grandma and great aunt Eugenia were, I would say it was around the early 1950s and I could see construction happening around the house. My grandma and her sister, they asked what they were fixing to the construction worker and he answered they were fixing the railings because the granddaughter was bringing her fiancé from Australia and the wedding would take place in the house. Grandma and her sister commented about how happy they were for the granddaughter to finally settle down and wished the construction worker good luck before leaving and continuing their stroll. I followed them, but I kept feeling pulled back and I was screaming for my grandma to hear me. The last thing I've heard was my grandma talking to her sister about the job she took in Pella as a teacher and was wondering if it was worth it to be this far away from Agio, their hometown. After that, I was pulled back into the house and it was now abandoned and I couldn't get out. I was crying and slamming my fists against the main door. Something else scared me after that because I had jumped up awake and I was crying in my sleep. I have no idea what that was, but after I recalled the dream, I went back and started staring at the house and wondering why I was watching the dream when I was about 10 years old. I haven't had a dream about that house ever since, but I feel a pull towards that house and I don't know why, especially the terrace. This happened a few minutes ago. I had just taken out of the oven my freshly baked vanilla and cinnamon raisin cakes and wanted to snap a photo of them to send to my best friend and my aunt. My camera had the AI option activated because I forgot to disable it after my outing on Friday night. So as I turned my camera toward the kitchen table, the AI sign showed one second, the food sign. Since I snapped a picture of the cakes, and the next, when facing the kitchen table and kitchen door, it showed the person again. The person sign appears when the AI features detects a person's presence. The thing is, that I was alone. My parents were napping and my sister is in her room studying. My aunt is working at her boyfriend's family farm, trying to finish before sundown and the rain comes. The house is my mum's and aunt's childhood home and my grandma lived in it from 1983 up to 2017 where she died in her sleep in her room, aka my parents' current bedroom. All of us have experienced something that might be considered as a presence, either by feeling a hand on our backs, shoulders or heads, but never on a camera or radio. Although my computer sometimes opens by itself in the middle of the night or day when it's in sleep mode, I don't think that has anything to do with the ghost. I found it odd, didn't feel a presence, and the person's sign remained for a moment when I placed the camera in the same spot again, a second after I realized what had happened. If there's a ghost after all, I think it's either my grandma or my grandpa, or both of them keeping an eye on us. Maybe they, she, he, wanted to see how the cakes turned out. This happened on Sunday the 16th of January, 2022. The first event happened at 8 p.m. I was in the WC of our house. We have a full bathroom and a WC. And I had a coughing fit that was really bad. As I calm down and I'm trying to catch my breath, I hear my mum's voice coming from the full bathroom, asking me if I'm okay. The bathrooms are connected with a common airway and we usually use it to speak to one another if it's necessary. Otherwise, it's used as an airway. I say that I'm okay and get out of the WC. And I go to knock at the full bathroom's door to reassure my mum that I'm okay. But nobody was in the bathroom. My mum was in her room on a computer. Confused, I asked mum if she's been to the bathroom for the past five minutes 
and she said she hadn't. She didn't want to lose any moments of her friend's radio program, so she was keeping her water intake to the minimum. I just shook my head and went on with my afternoon. The second event happened at 6am. I was about to head to bed after spending the entire night writing. I'm more creative at night. And I decided that it was enough writing for tonight and went to brush my teeth and pee before bed. I'm peeing when someone knocks on the door and then I hear my dad's voice asking me if I'm okay. I say yes and he says all right before I hear him enter the kitchen and open the small kitchen light and I hear him prepare the kettle for his coffee and prepare my sister's breakfast. I look at my phone and it's 6.15am and I think that dad might have woken up an hour earlier than usual because he couldn't sleep. He usually wakes up at 7am and starts waking my sister up for school. It wasn't unusual for my dad to wake up at 6 or 5am or not sleep at all at night reading comics on his computer waiting for 7am. So I shrug it off and get on with my thing. But when I finish and I'm shutting the light, I turn to say good morning to my dad. But the kitchen is empty and dark. Dad is nowhere to be seen. I gently go to my parents' room and I can hear my mum's and dad's snores. So I go to my room to sleep. At 7am, I woke up to the sound of my dad's alarm clock. And I got up to ask my dad if he went to the kitchen around 6am. And he said no, but had a dream of getting a glass of water from the kitchen. So my ex-boyfriend and I went our separate ways about six years ago because he was a raging alcoholic. And of course, being the weak-willed person I was, I became one too. So I had the opportunity to move a few states away with some friends who would do anything and everything they could to help me get my life back on track. I gave him an ultimatum. Stay here, continue drinking and die. Or come with me and let's start fresh and do something with our lives we could be proud of. He chose to stay. He died a month later. I carried around a lot of guilt about it for a long time, especially since my now ex-best friend told me he killed himself over me. Not the case. However, here's where it gets a little weird. He has a twin brother who died of an epileptic seizure in the upstairs bathroom of their house after falling and hitting his head on the sink. My ex-boyfriend died of an epileptic seizure exactly one year to the day of the anniversary of his twin brother's death in the same bathroom of the same house by hitting his head on the same sink. And now, the final eerie frosting on top of the eerie cake came today, when I was going through my files. And I came upon one file folder, and as I pulled it out of the plastic tub there kept in, I immediately recognised a familiar handwriting that said, Josh is speaking to me from beyond the grave. My god, I have the heebie-jeebies right now. So this all happens when I'm half asleep, but definitely still conscious as I remember what I saw and my responding to it in detail. I mention that because being close to sleep is a bit of a disqualifier for me, since it could be just a dream or my brain being sleepy, so take my experience with a grain of salt. I have this recurring almost dream where a shadow figure, always in the shape of a snake that I would guesstimate to be about six-ish feet long, approaches my bed while I'm trying to sleep. More specifically, it keeps trying to get around me to where my girlfriend is asleep. It will vanish without fail if confronted, which is where my girlfriend comes in. She's woken up to me telling various spots in the room off. She describes it like I'm commanding a pet. One time she was awake and watched me calmly set up and fling my pillow at something. I remember every interaction and it always goes just how she describes it. So unlike classic sleepwalking, I'm posting because last night we were house sitting for my parents and I had another experience, pretty uneventful. I just glared at it and said, don't you fucking try. And she said it was probably a bit more intimidating than I intended. But this morning she made the comment that it's weird, that this only happens at my parents' house and only when we stay in this one specific guest room. It's never happened anywhere else, including other rooms in the same house, which made me wonder what could be causing this interaction. (laughs) 
So a while ago, I responded to what I think to be a poltergeist. I responded to a house in a rather okay neighbourhood. Houses were well taken care of despite being mostly built in the early 80s. Most, if not all, two-storey homes. Early in the morning, dispatch notified me of a possible home invasion or robbery of one of the houses by an anonymous tip from a supposed concerned neighbour. The following are details that I jotted down in my patrol book shortly after the incident. Date, 24th of January 2022. Dispatch notified by concerned neighbour at 0217 hours of light and sounds coming from a home whose occupants are known to be on vacation. First unit on the scene, me, at 0224, with unit call sign Charlie 2, shift sergeant, arriving approximately two minutes later at 0226. Upon initial inspection of the home, no evidence of forced entry on either front and back doors, which were locked. First story windows appear to be secured. Residence is a two-story dwelling with a single light on upstairs. Upon dispatch making contact with the homeowners, we were advised of a spare key hidden in a fake rock, located near the main steps under a small bush in front of the house. Decision was made to make entry, 0230. Two more units arrived, Charlie 4 and Charlie 9. Entry of the house, weapons drawn. Two man teams were utilised to clear the house. Upon initial inspection, the main foyer was clear, with no evidence of tampering. Dining room and den slash living room was also clear, with no evidence of tampering. Kitchen and laundry room showed evidence of tampering, with various drawers and cabinets open. Freezer door was ajar and several items spilled out. Several knives from the knife block appeared missing or strewn about the floor of the kitchen. Laundry room light was on and laundry detergent were deposited on the floor. Several items of clothing were torn and strewn on the floor. Door was slightly damaged along with the drywall where the doorknob struck it. Upstairs hall light was on. Two out of three doors were ajar with one room that had its light on. Upon entering the room with the door open with the light on, appears to be the master bedroom. Bed was not made with pillows thrown about. Blankets and sheets were balled up at the foot of the bed. Master bathroom light was also on, with a large mirror that appeared to be shattered. Several articles of clothing which were ripped similar to the ones in the laundry room were thrown about. Some on the floor, some in the bathtub, and some in the sink of the two sink vanity shards of mirror all over the floor and bathtub. The last two rooms were searched and deemed cleared. Room 2, which was also open, had several items tampered with. The doorknob appeared damaged. The bed was unmade and sheets and blankets were balled up at the foot of the bed, similar to the master bedroom. Room 3, door was closed, had no evidence of tampering. Upon rallying in the main foyer of the first floor of the house, several large bangs and what was perceived as heavy footfalls appeared to be coming from upstairs. I, Charlie 2 and Charlie 9, made our way back upstairs where the master bedroom door was again ajar. All upstairs bedroom doors were closed before going back downstairs. A lone picture laid on the entrance of the master bedroom, which appeared to have two large burned holes through the faces of both people in the picture. Master bedroom had several pictures removed from the wall and placed on the ottoman at the foot of the bed. All pictures were damaged to include broken glass, bent and warped frames. Several shoes were also removed from the closet and placed on the nightstand and the lamp was knocked over. Upstairs was again swept and no other anomalies were discovered. All upstairs windows were locked and secured. All lights were subsequently turned off and all doors were secured and locked. Upon exit of the house, dispatch was notified no persons were found inside the house and the house was again secured. However, damages were observed in several rooms. Decision was made to patrol the street and surrounding neighbourhood. I and Charlie 9 remained in the area on patrol. All units departed at 0410. Approximately 0422, Charlie 9 drove past the house and all lights, including exterior lights, were on. Glow from the inside of the house, where the den slash living room was located, appeared that the TV was on. Dispatch was notified and I arrived on scene again approximately 0424. Entry was again made of the house 
Several appliances, including the gas stove, was on. All five burners. Microwave and garbage disposal. TV was on with full volume. Dryer was running along with the washing machine. And a radio could be heard playing at full volume upstairs. First floor was again cleared. Upon clearing the last room, the laundry room, heavy footfalls along with sounds of grunting and dog-like growling could be heard from upstairs. No dog was present who observed the first time we entered. Our presence was announced and we made our way up the stairs. Again, weapons drawn. Sounds were emitting from the master bedroom and orders to step out with hands held up in plain view was demanded. These orders were announced several times, all the while sounds of growling and murmuring was heard. Upon entry to the master bedroom, the nightstands were now upside down on the master bed. All drawers from the dressers were open and clothing articles were strewn about. All noises, including appliances, stopped once we made entry into the master bath. All lights, including the master bath lights, were turned off without us doing so. Upon exiting the master bedroom, going down the stairs and exiting the front door of the house, we notified dispatch of our findings and concluded that we will no longer be entering the premises. Charlie 1, shift lieutenant, and Charlie 2 arrived on scene to document the findings at approximately 0500. Pictures were taken of the scene to include the damages observed before being forcibly pushed by an unknown entity. Charlie 2 sustained minor abrasions on left forearm and minor laceration behind right ear from being knocked over. No further personnel permitted on premises until the arrival of homeowners. All pictures and reports were given to investigations for further follow-up. The village I lived in was only about 40 to 50 people at most. Everyone knew everyone. All 12 of us kids knew each other and played with each other. Naturally, some of us grouped together and explored the surrounding area since there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then, mid to late 90s, in rural Ohio. The village was old. The furthest back I could find about the village documentation wise was that it was established back in the late 1790s as a small trading hub for the local area. Ohio didn't become a state until 1803. My village had a single church in the centre of it, an old schoolhouse converted into an actual house just next to it, and pasture behind it with thick woods surrounding three of the four sides of the small town. Again, as said prior, my dad grew up around the area, so he was full of legends and stories about the area. One of those stories was about a small fort that was originally French, turned British and finally colonial America in the area. Nobody really knew where exactly it was located, but there were a few mentions of a small fort in the area from the research I did. One of the stories about this fort was that it was a primary trade route for the local native tribes, and the influx of settlers that were arriving in the area. Naturally, conflicts arose as more and more people settled the surrounding area, and eventually all-out conflict ensued between the settlers and the native tribes. The fort was said to be destroyed by fire. People on both sides slaughtered each other, and eventually the natives were driven from the area with the help of a local militia. My dad always told me the land wasn't good, tainted in ways with bad energy. I guess when entire families are slaughtered and people being driven from their homeland, it can cause some long-term ill effects. When all of us kids were playing, we were always told two things. One, if the woods get quiet, you get quiet and leave immediately. Two, if your name is being called out and you're way out in the woods, do not respond. Go home immediately and never look back. Pretend you never heard it to begin with. Everyone in the village knew how quirky the area was. Most days were the usual bland days. On Sundays, it was like a fairy tale. Periodically, other days, it could be a nightmare. Now, the people of the woods were probably the most common entity everyone in the village knew of, and were generally treated with respect and a wide berth. Some of the other things were generally best left, well enough alone entirely. In the late 90s, I was around nine years old, when I was overcome with an insatiable desire to go camping. It was mid-August, so hot and muggy during the day 
but rather mild and cool at night. I gathered two of my friends and told them about it, and they both liked the idea. Now generally, nobody really camped in our woods. My parents, along with many others, really didn't like the idea of a group of 10 and 11 year olds going out camping alone. My dad said we could as long as he came with us, just to ensure we were safe. I reluctantly agreed. Prior to that night, I went out to scout out a good area to make camp at, and I knew of a fairly decent place that was close to the creek, relatively flat and not too difficult to get to. I wanted to scout the area just to ensure it was cleared of debris and ready for tents. By this time, I was well acquainted with the people of the woods, and I made my offering before entering the woods. I didn't see them well on my journey or anything, so I felt pretty good about that. Once I arrived at the location, I began moving things around, clearing out the sticks, large stones and making a fire pit, even going as far as stocking it with wood and throwing some larger sticks nearby for fuel for later. I was so enthralled in what I was doing and so focused on getting the area cleared that by the time I was satisfied with what I had done, I just noticed just how quiet everything around me came. When I say quiet, I mean dead silent. No birds, bugs, not even the wind made a noise amongst the leaf litter. I immediately shut down everything I was doing. I stood there looking around, slowing my breathing and just trying to listen for the faintest sound I could. I don't know how long I stood there, motionless. A few minutes maybe, and then in the far distance I could hear a crow call. And almost immediately, I began hearing the chirping of robins, and even a faint whistling from the wind in the trees. The hair on my arms and neck were on end, and I figured, well, maybe it was just me making a ruckus, that everything nearby quieted down because of that. Content with that logical reasoning, I began making my way back home to pack up for the night. Around 6pm that night, my two friends made their way over with backpacks, tents, and both me and my dad were finishing up dinner. All four of us made ready with everything we needed, and began trekking out to the site I prepared. Nothing all that noteworthy happened going to the site, even after setting up our tents, lighting the fire and making s'mores. It was shaping up to be a pretty fun night and rather enjoyable. Once we started to get ready to crawl into our tents for the night around 10 or 11pm, the wind started to pick up and my dad said we might be in for some rain, but he didn't seem to have a look of contentment. My dad loved rain, on his face when he said it. It was like he felt something was off. And it wasn't long that all of us started to feel that way. We all ended up crawling in our tents anyway since it was night. And possible rain incoming, trekking back home would have sucked. We should have walked back. We situated our tents in a half circle around the fire pits. Which were all facing the creek. And the back of the tents facing the wood line. My dad was to the left of me in his military surplus tent. Me in my cheapo Walmart single person tent just barely large enough for me, and my two friends to my right in their own tents. The wind howled for some time, half an hour to an hour before it calmed down. Then it got quiet. No crickets, no wind, no wildlife. The creek itself, which usually bubbles happily along, sounded muted. All we had was the faint glow of embers from the fire pit in front of our tents, casting a warm glow. I could hear my heart throb in my ears, and I knew my dad and two friends were just as anxious as I was, as I could hear them shift uncomfortably. I heard one of my friend's tent zipper, and naturally I undid my zipper, too, to see what was going on. As soon as I popped my head out to look, I saw my dad come out of his tent with the machete he had, and he faced the wood line. My friend had his head poking out too, and asked if I heard that noise. I didn't hear anything. My heart was pounding so hard, it was hard hearing him even whisper. We both partially got out of the tent to see what my dad was looking at, but all we could see was inky darkness. And then I heard it, a distant and faint, hello? It was coming from some ways away in the darkness of the woods. I could see my dad shift uncomfortably on his feet, white knuckling his machete looking into the wood line. Then again, the voice called out again. Hello? 
It didn't seem right. Off-putting. Almost as if whoever was speaking was trying to speak in a very feminine voice. Faint and fragile. My dad motioned me to grab some of the extra wood next to his tent and throw it on the fire, which I reluctantly did. Leaving the perceived safety of my tent didn't sit well with me. As the fire began to slowly grow in brightness, my dad stepped backwards near the fire and stood there facing the wood line. By this time, my other friend popped his head out of his tent too, and all three of us, including my dad, were watching the wood line, unsure what to expect. Nothing came out, and we didn't hear the voice again. An hour passed, and by this time, my dad was sitting on a large stone next to his tent, one leg crossed and a machete in his right hand, watching silently, only the sound of crackling fire echoing against the shale cliff face across the creek. Several hours passed, and both of my friends went back into their tents. Only me and my dad were out, me tending the fire and my dad watching and waiting. I could hear rustling to our right, just beyond the light from the fire in the tree line. My friend closest to it popped his head out, looked at me and asked me, what? As if he was wanting me to repeat what I said. I didn't say a word, hadn't said a word since I came out of my tent the first time. I put my finger up to my lips and motioned to be quiet. By the time I did so, my dad was standing next to me and told us both to shush. And immediately, we heard someone say, come here. In the same off-putting feminine voice as earlier. All three of us just stood there, peering in the direction of where the voice came from. And shortly after, we heard what sounded like something moving back deeper into the woods. It didn't sound heavy. It sounded light, like something lightly trotting back into the woods. That was the last time we heard it. Shortly after, I'm assuming early morning, just before daybreak, the wood life returned. Crickets, the distant chirp of birds, and the whisper from the wind through the leaves. Once daybreak came, we all broke down our tents, packed up, and began hiking back home. We were paranoid the entire way back, stopping, listening, looking. We didn't see or hear anything or anyone. Nobody said a word on the way back. Once we made it to my backyard, my dad broke the silence and told us what we had experienced never happened. And it would do us good not to say a word to anyone about it. He had fear written all over his face, as if not even he had experienced something like that. To this day, I don't know what it was or who it was. I did end up asking my aunt next door later in life. If she experienced something similar, since she grew up in the area too. But even she was tight-lipped about it, saying we shouldn't have gone camping out there, and my dad was a fool for letting us go. I've since left my village and moved out of state, and I've run into similar stories down here in the southeast, with the same reluctance to explain what it was or could be. I have a story of potential hauntings from my mum, dad and brother. They're all kind of interesting. However, I wasn't present for any of these events, so cannot confirm their validity or if they've been exaggerated. They get pretty wild. However, they're interesting nonetheless, so I'll give it a go. So first off, my mum's story. So this occurred before I was born, when my brother was about seven years old, although he's not really involved in the story. My mum lived in a different town than where I grew up. She had a friend called Pat, I believe, who had a husband called Billy. She had known them for years as she used to work with Pat, and when they were looking for a new house, she advised the one next to her which was up for rent at the time. It was an attached house with my mum, dad and brother on one side, and Pat and her husband on the other. Apparently, within the first few weeks of living there, Billy became incredibly irritable losing his temper over the most minor of things, and after several months became physically violent. It got to a point where Pat had a secret knock she used on the wall, as the two rooms were literally through the wall from each other, to signify that Bill was hurting her and for my mum or dad to come around straight away, which would instantly calm Billy down and make Pat feel more secure. While all this was going on, Pat also mentioned that whenever she and Billy went out for the day, 
they would come home to a completely ransacked house. With the furniture tipped over and the cupboard doors open and sometimes ripped off. The house was also incredibly cold all the time. One night, my mum heard lots of crashing, seemingly coming from next door. The dog was barking and she heard the TV turn up incredibly loud, which she believed was Billy turning the TV up to tune out the arguing. She said after the TV had turned off, she heard the familiar knock against their bedroom wall and claimed she could hear an extremely loud female crying through the wall. She said the knocking became more frantic and the crying got louder. And my mum believed that Pat was in serious trouble. So immediately ran out of the house and to next door where she found the front door of Pat and Billy's house open. The dog was barking in the living room where the door was closed. My mum shouted their names but got no answer and heard no sound. It was as if the house was empty. She had a quick look around and saw Pat and Billy driving up the driveway. My mum freaked out and ran over to say she heard someone in the house to which Billy ran in and started looking around. Pat started freaking out, claiming there was a demon on the staircase, but neither my mum nor Billy could see anything. Billy apparently started walking up the stairs, but only got a few steps up before falling backwards and down the stairs. He claimed he was pushed and they all freaked out and left the house. Allegedly, they mustered the courage to go back in and found the house completely ransacked as usual. They moved in with Pat's mum the next day after packing and started looking for somewhere else to live. My mum claims that shortly after they left and while the house was still empty, things would get thrown from the windows at her when she was going to her car. My mum also moved out shortly after. Apparently, after Pat and Billy left that house, Billy went back to the gentle giant he was before moving in and the physical and verbal abuse ceased almost instantaneously. According to Pat, at least, I heard the story from all three of them, and it stays the same, so inclined to believe it. Story two, my dad. My dad used to work in a coal mine as a health and safety inspector. One day, he and a fella called Geordie were sent to check if any gases or something had leaked in a specific part of the mine, which was rarely ever used. They checked it out, it was all clear and they started heading back. The miners apparently used to take any opportunity they could if they were out of the way of other miners to have a quick nap. So my dad and Geordie did just that. My dad said he woke up to feel someone poking him. He turned to Geordie and told him to stop. But Geordie was understandably confused. They went back to sleep, but the same thing happened again. Although this time, when my dad woke Geordie up, Geordie started panicking as another light was coming down the tunnel toward them. They couldn't see the people, given how dark it was, just the helmet lights. However, they thought it was a supervisor coming to check on them, and they worried they had overslept. My dad said he used one of the phones along the line to ask who had been sent down to check on them, and that they were coming back now. The manager claimed that nobody else should be in that section of the mine, and that they need to tell them to head back to where they should be. My dad and Geordie started shouting to the person, but apparently the light just started moving toward them at a rapid rate. Apparently a figure zoomed between them. They couldn't make it out, but it was incredibly fast and the light seemed to be from what looked like a helmet. My dad and Geordie apparently spun around to see this figure disappearing down the mine shaft into the darkness. They understandably did a runner back to the supervisors and got ribbed for it but my dad swears to this day that he saw something down in that mine shaft. Story three, my brother. The last story now, and probably the shortest. When I was a kid, I had a friend called Lewis. He was a family friend, and my dad was good friends with his dad. He ended up moving to a new house, offshoot from a farm. The guy who owned the farmhouse also had a huge barn. He was moving to Spain, and had just filled the barn with a ton of junk that he no longer wanted, and it was absolutely filled to the brim there. He told my friend's family that they could help themselves to whatever was in the barn. I was about 11 or 12, and my brother was about 21, 22. 
Me and Lewis had a route around and I remember finding a Ouija board, which as a kid, I thought nothing of. Just picked it up, looked at it and heard about them, but just tossed it to the side. My main interest in the barn was the commando figures and the zoo magazines. For anyone unfamiliar, they were an old porn magazine in the UK before it became easily accessible on the internet. My brother, however, would go into that barn and after his first experience there, he went in once with Lewis. There were two floors, him and Lewis on the top floor and Lewis's dad and my dad and me on the bottom floor. Those two were upstairs when apparently a remote controlled car drove along the floor between the two of them. My brother laughed and picked it up and freaked out because it had no batteries in it. Him and Lewis came down explaining what had happened but the dad just kind of laughed at them. It freaked me out though. After that, my brother would not go into that barn. However, two or three visits later, he claimed he saw a face on the top floor of the barn at the window, staring down at him while he was in the garden. But the rest of us didn't see it. So this happened back in 2006. My entire family got their green cards and after 10 years of being in the States, we wanted to visit home. There was a problem with me. I didn't receive my green card, but a piece of paper saying I was a resident and can come back to the States. This caused another problem. I couldn't go with my mother or little brother, but I think that was just an excuse, but that's for another time. My mother was to go one day and me the next. So I slept over at my uncle's house so he could drive me to the airport. I was 16 and had traveled a lot by this point, so I knew how airports worked. I get to his home the same night my mother leaves to go to the airport. He has a pull out couch, but it was nicer. I was really tired when I got there for some reason. I put my stuff down, put on my PJs and laid in bed. I was out almost immediately. I had a dream, or I hope it was a dream, that I could see myself sleeping on the pull-out couch. I was hovering above my body when I noticed the sheets folded neatly up to my ankles, and I saw and felt myself getting pulled. My arm was under my pillow, and I felt my body being pulled, but I didn't feel anyone touching me. I saw myself moving, and I woke up tired and said, I'm in here only for tonight. I'm leaving the country in the morning, so leave me the fuck alone and let me sleep. You'll get what you want. I assumed it was either a dream or I had a paranormal experience. So to make sure I wasn't messed with again, I said what I said. The reason why I think it was paranormal was because the bottom of my sheets were neatly folded. But by then, it was halfway up my calves. I didn't say anything to anyone in my family because I had a reputation of being a liar. So I knew I would be beating a dead horse with a stick if I said anything. A year later, I hear my uncle and his wife talk about the experiences they've had at their house. They've seen an old man, some woman, and stuff being moved. Come to find out up a hill by their house is a cemetery. I never said anything to them. I haven't told many people this story because even though it happened to me and I can remember how it looked and felt, I know it's hard to believe. If anyone asks what it looks like when I was floating, everything looked slightly foggy, if that makes sense. A couple of months ago, my husband and I were tasked with packing and cleaning his mother's house. She had already left to go stay with her father since her husband, my father-in-law, had recently passed away in the house. About three weeks into my stay there, I was cleaning up the kitchen for dinner. The kitchen pretty much was part of the living room, separated by only a bar-like counter. As I was cleaning the counter, I happened to look up and I noticed a small yellowish orb thing kind of dancing weirdly up the wall by the ceiling. I looked outside to see if maybe a passing car's headlights might have been casting a glare, but there was no one and I was home alone right then. A few nights later, as we were just laying down in bed, I had my earplugs in and our two dogs were laying down with us. Right after we turned off the lights, 
I swear I heard three knocks on or near the front door as we were sleeping in the living room. Heart pounding, I sat up and listened through my earplugs, noticing that our two dogs were laying perfectly still with no reaction. I asked my husband if he heard it and he said no. But for some reason, I just felt scared of that sound and my heart was pounding. But then, in that tense moment, my husband turns his face to face me and he says something that I literally responded to with, why can't you be saying this on a bright sunny day outside with lots of people around? He said to me, I think I sense a ghost. I didn't say anything. I just squeezed my eyes shut and hoped it would go away. Not even a couple minutes later, he grabbed my arm and whispered urgently that he saw a small yellow orb on the wall below the ceiling where I'd seen it before. He also told me that the ceiling fan above us had started slowly turning on its own. I didn't see either since my eyes were closed, so I just let it go. But a couple mornings later, we were sitting in the living room discussing the previous events, and I looked up and noticed the ceiling fan slowly turning by itself. I gave an awkward laugh and said that it was probably because of a draft from the heater being on, or maybe an electrical issue. But then, as I said that, the fan stopped and started to slowly turn the opposite direction. The only way to make it do that is by flipping a manual switch on the ceiling fan itself. So, pretty much a no-go on the electrical problem theory. Perhaps maybe a draft from the central heat being on? I don't know. You decide. This story transpired many years ago, when my now 18-year-old daughter was five years old. It was never uncommon that after giving my daughter a bath before putting her in bed, for the evening that my wife, myself and my daughter would end up in our bedroom as we got her toweled off in her pyjamas and ready for bed that evening. This night we were all laying in the bed as usual, laughing, talking and catching up as we normally did. Through all the fun and laughter, my daughter stopped and took a serious tone with us. We both asked my daughter, what's the matter? And she's now laying on her back and looking towards the corner ceiling in our bedroom, asked matter of fact in a hushed tone, what do angels look like? Neither my wife nor I are very religious, but have grown up with religion in our lives as children and young adults. My wife grew up with Buddhist teachings and me, Catholic slash Baptist. So we both had knowledge of what the scriptures and texts describe as what angels typically look like. Thinking this is a prime teaching moment and both me and my wife jump on it. We run down the look of what a classic angel looks like or form what we know from growing up that we've been told explicitly that they look like. Beautiful, glowing, wings, dressed in a white and flowing white dress. They're kind and loving and are sent to watch over us, to protect us in our times of need. My daughter's eyes never strayed from the corner of the room as we both gave our best description of what we thought an angel looked like and their purpose in our lives. If we're fortunate enough to see one, we both noticed her gaze after our best attempt to provide her with the best information we could muster up concerning her very important question. She points to the corner of the room and ceiling that her eyes have been affixed to and says, they look like that, right? Dumbfounded and a little frightened, my wife and I quickly look to where she's pointing to see nothing. We ask, sweetie, what do you see? She said to both of us, I see an angel right there on the wall. Don't you see her? She's pretty. Utterly shaken, a little frightened and disappointed that me or my wife could not share in the experience she was having. We could not see what it was she was clearly seeing. And I know I struggled my hardest to try and will this being to show itself to me. I had to explain to my little one that the older we get, sometimes these special things don't allow us to see them because we, adults, may not understand. And if she sees it, then it's perhaps her guardian angel, letting her know they were there watching over her and protecting her, and that it's truly a great thing. 
After what seemed like ages, but I'm sure it took nothing but a few seconds, my daughter started the angel and was ready for bed. In that moment, as I carried her to bed, I was both grateful and sad. Grateful that she may have been something many of us never get to see. Sad that my eyes could not see this being. That my sight had been blinded and shut off from sharing this moment with my daughter. Because I may be blinded due to age, life and experiences. To this day, I still wish both myself and my wife could have truly seen and experienced that moment with my daughter. Mr. D.H. is a big, burly man's man. I've always known him to be matter-of-fact and have never taken him for someone easily frightened or prone to emotional outburst. However, this story he relayed to me still haunts me and frankly rocked me to my core. I know for a fact that he believes wholeheartedly the events that took place, based on his emotions, facial expressions and the tears that ensued as he told me this story. Mr. D.H. has a long history of heart disease and had been in and out of the hospital for issues and symptoms attributed to this. He wasn't a stranger to the local hospital or the emergency room doctors and staff based solely on this medical issue. Mr. D.H. was rushed to the hospital complaining of terrible chest pains. Once in the ER, he was rushed to the operating room immediately for a triple heart bypass surgical procedure due to sustaining a massive heart attack and just minutes away from dying. While on the table and being worked on, he did indeed pass away, while doctors were working frantically to save his life. This was confirmed from the medical documentation that he presented to me from the hospital that eventually saved his life. This is where the story truly takes an odd and numbing turn. Teary-eyed and emotional, Mr. D.H. states that he was hyper-aware that he had expired, died during the procedure. Trying hard to fight the emotions back and now speaking past a stream of tears, he states, man, the fucked up part is that I stood in absolute darkness, very much aware of nothing, absolutely nothing around me but darkness, absolute blackness, nothing. As I stood in the blackness which seemed like forever, there was no bright light that everyone talked about. No one came to meet me, no sound, no nothing. As he calmed down some, he went on to state how he remembered the process of returning to his body. Walking up to the operating table past the surgical team, and then immense pain that followed as he was now once again back in his body. He turned, wiped the tears from his eyes, and sadly said, I know now that there is nothing out there for me when I die again. No one will be there for me, and I'm convinced there's nothing out there at all. Nothing but darkness, sadness, and loneliness. I don't want to die again anytime soon. I'm afraid I'll be left out there all alone. I tried my best to bring some comfort to my friend, but what do you say to that? How do you find words to perhaps comfort him? I faltered, despite my deep concern for my friend after his major life experience. There really are no words, no explanation, no making right this one man's terrible experience. This incident took place about two months ago. I'm not sure if this is a true paranormal occurrence or a mechanical slash electrical or radio wave glitch. I'll allow you to be the judge. I work for a small medical clinic in Northern California. It's not uncommon for me to reach the clinic before my other co-workers and open the clinic for my co-workers that will be arriving after me. Our clinic has instituted the use of walkie talkies so that we can keep a tab on each other's whereabouts in case there may be a need for help with a patient or to alert staff when a patient has arrived for their appointment. Per my normal routine, I placed my bag at my desk, proceeded to turn the clinic lights and began checking the clinic to see if any of my other co-workers made it in before me. After checking the back offices and making my way to the front offices, it was clear that I was the first and only person in the office. I had made my way to the front office to grab my walkie-talkie for the day. I turned it on, and as usual, there was nothing, but silence on the other end. Nothing is expected. I made my way back to my office and desk, 
sat at my computer and began going through my paperwork and schedule for the day. Suddenly, over the walkie-talkie comes a voice that I readily recognise. The voice of my front desk co-worker, whom I had not seen when doing my room and office check for the facility. Over the now crackle, static and increased volume from the previously silent walkie-talkie, I hear the recognisable voice of my co-worker saying, Hello, where are you? After which, the walkie-talkie turns silent once more. Startled now and thinking to myself, how in the hell did I miss hearing someone come through the now only unlocked door in the facility? The door in which my office sits next to. I grabbed the walkie-talkie and holding down the response button said, I'm in my office, when did you get in? There was no response back, just silence. I sat and waited for my co-worker to poke her head in the office. Nothing. I shouted out, hello? Nothing. No sound of movement or noise in the quiet office. No footsteps, no rustling or shuffling of feet. Just absolute quiet. I got up and made my way through the clinic, thinking someone was trying to prank me by pulling a scare on me. And once again, after checking all the rooms, front and back offices, there was nothing or no one there. Just me. Dumbfounded, I made my way back to the office, sat down, and shortly thereafter, the second co-worker arrived. The very one whose voice I had just heard over the walkie-talkie. I ran and met her at the door, asking if she had a walkie-talkie on her, and was using it to scare someone in the office. She proclaimed, no, they're all put up and off, why would I do that? I stated that you called me and asked me where I was at. She looked at me puzzled and said, no, I don't have a walkie-talkie. They're all in the same place where you got yours, all turned off. I checked, and indeed they were all accounted for except for mine, and were all turned off except for the one I had taken earlier. I explained that she contacted me over the walkie-talkie, and I had been going through the clinic trying to find her. She chuckled and called me crazy, and walked onto her desk. I cannot explain what or how it happened, but it was her voice. I recognised it enough to search the clinic looking for her. I know walkie-talkies can pick up other frequencies and people talking on other stations as well as CB chatter, but this voice was specific, one that I recognise. I've been working with this particular co-worker for over eight years now and know her voice. It's sort of ingrained in my brain, but it could not have been her. She was never there. I'm convinced that perhaps it was something in the ether reaching out for me. The chatter over the walkie-talkies is totally recognisable and abrupt. What came over my walkie-talkie that day I opened the clinic was not it. It was truly a calm, recognisable voice, asking where I was. Let me start with a little backstory of myself from recent events, so that you have a detailed picture of what went on in my life that perhaps could lead to this crazy thing I experienced. I'm a 31 year old house father that's blessed with a beautiful son and daughter and a lovely wife. I'm going through a stressful period of my life. My mother had a rare brain hemorrhage about eight years ago, brainstem aneurysm in a difficult place. Her chance of survival was 10% and 1% chance that she would survive without any disabilities. Miraculously, she survived and barely has any problems apart from being more direct than usual. This happened at the funeral of my grandma, who passed away in 2013. A few years later, she got a cerebral infraction while she went through the MRI. They also saw a little tumour. However, it appears that tumour is not growing and can't do much bad to her health. A few months later, after all this, my father got a heart attack. He got picked up by an ambulance and they had to do an open heart surgery. This went wrong. The sack where the heart is in was filled with blood. In total, they opened his chest three times in a time span of a week. That was in 2019. They also removed three blood clots. After all this, he felt like a new person and could breathe and move way better for some reason, which is good. Between all of this, I had a business that went bankrupt back in 2016. Barely could afford anything and nearly lost my house. If you sum all this up, I was on quite a roller coaster the last eight years. Okay, 
Now for the crazy thing that I experienced. Due to all these events that happened around me, I started to smoke weed frequently so that in the evening I'm calm and chill. I guess it became a getaway slash under the carpet kind of thing. I was smoking for more than a year almost every day. I'm from the Netherlands, so it's legal here to buy it. I must add to this that my wife didn't know that I was smoking weed almost every day. She knows I'm occasionally smoking, but I was good at concealing it, just like you would expect of an addict. Normally I smoke one gram in two joints per evening. However, you have the option here to buy ready spinned joints in the shop. I bought these, which contain not even 20% of the weed that I normally put in a joint. It contains like 0.1 gram, instead of my usual half a gram. Therefore, what I'm going to write next can't be because you have a very small percentage of THC in one's blood. Anyway, yesterday night, after I went outside to smoke some weed, I came back and started laying on the sofa, playing some FIFA 22. I was all alone since my children were already in bed, and my wife had a little fever, so she went to bed early. I started to feel my heartbeat raising, to a level that is completely abnormal. I got stabs in my heart and it went to my left arm. Exactly the symptoms my father had. I thought I was going to die. While the stabbing became more and more intense, to a moment that I really thought I'm dying, a being or person or thing started to communicate with me through my mind, revealing itself, actually communicating that he, she, it is questioning if I want to die right now or not. And I had to promise that I would change my life right now, else he would let me die right here, right now. I begged for my life while crying intensely and promised myself unto him, her, it, that I would instantly change myself directly. I also had to go to my wife straight and tell everything, as well as the secret that I'm smoking more than she knows. After I genuinely begged for my life and agreed that this is the end, the old me is dead and the new me will arise. I felt the pressure fading away through my throat. After it faded away, I could feel the energy of everything around me. I could even truly feel the energy of my can of cola and had a feeling I could move it if I could focus enough. However, filled with emotions, I couldn't focus enough. Since I suddenly had a pure connection with my wife's brain, it felt that I had a straight, pure connection line with my wife's brain upstairs. This is the best I can put it into words. I stormed upstairs emotionally, as I felt she felt it too. However, when I came into our bedroom, she was sleeping and woken up by my hysterical behaviour. I felt so awakened, I felt so powerful. I felt like I was way beyond the thinking of a normal person. My wife was of course worried that I really had a heart attack. However, while she was saying this, he, she, it was directly communicated to me. While my wife wanted to call emergency service, that I have nothing to worry about and that this was the only way to warn me since I'm a stubborn guy. I was so confused, still am now. Who is this? What is this? How is this possible? You must realise I've never really seen things or experienced anything like this. I was so scared that I was losing my mind and that I would have to go to a mental institution or something. However, it felt so clear. I can't describe it in words really. Most people talk with themselves, right? It sometimes really feels like you have someone sitting on your shoulder left and right. I always wondered if that is a second version of me. Or is it like the devil and the angel on different shoulders? Or is it actually someone that is in a different dimension? Or just my mind talking to myself? I don't know if this makes sense, but to me it does. Lately, I'm more and more open to spirituality. I'm more willing to open myself more, and I wanted to start meditating. While I got this heart attack, or whatever it was, while I had these intense stabs, I found out that the one I was talking to for years was real. It was all real. It really scared me. Like a demon was all along with me and wanted to kill me. Sounds weird, but that went through my mind. That's all I could think about at that moment. It was safer, this thought, that the communication started and I had to make the promise. It didn't feel negative anymore. I guess the unknown can be very scary and can make you think it's something negative. When I was explaining everything to my wife, 
she never doubted me and fully believed what I experienced. While I was in bed with my wife, I tried to focus on who or what it is and where it is so that I could get some answers. You must know I'm not religious. I do believe there's something, which got confirmed to me yesterday night. However, I do not believe in God, Jesus, Buddha, Allah, and so on. But I do know now that there's something higher than that. That's all I can say. Don't ask me how and why. I just know now. Anyway, while I was trying to find out who or what it was, some people crossed my mind, including my grandma. As soon as I thought about her, I could feel her energy. I could communicate. How is this possible? What the fuck? But I was so emotional that I couldn't stop crying, especially when I felt my grandma. I have goosebumps all over my body since this happened to my yesterday. By the way, I did go to the doctor this morning to check if I had to worry about something. However, for some reason, I knew exactly what he would say. Uh, it's probably stress and experienced a panic attack. My wife has had a lot of panic attacks in the past and let me tell you, what I experienced was nothing like a panic attack or anything close to that. Probably I'm forgetting to add stuff here about what I felt etc. However, it feels like it's impossible to explain in words what I experienced last night. My mind still can't comprehend what happened. I'm 22 and an out-of-state college student. I'm just going to get right to the point because, to be honest, I'm kind of freaked out. On Thanksgiving break, I was visiting my parents' house. And while I was the only one awake, I walked to the kitchen to get myself some water. I was Snapchatting with my boyfriend while walking down the hall, about to send a funny picture when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. I saw a shadow of a man about five feet tall, just six feet away from me. As I passed the living room, I shined my light on it and there was nothing there. About a week later, this was later recounted to me by my dad at Christmas, whom I had not told about the Thanksgiving encounter. My sister, her friend and my mom had to run to the store and my dad stayed home. He was watching TV in the living room when he saw a five foot tall figure wearing a hoodie walk from the hallway to the kitchen. He told me it was so realistic he took it for my sister, same weight, wears hoodies, and said, I thought you went with them to the store. He walked into the kitchen and nothing was there. No one was in any bedrooms or the bathroom either. I asked him if it walked like her, heavy footed, and he said no, that it more so glided along its path. Fast forward to now, a little over a month later, and my roommate and I are snowing into our house. My mum calls me and when I greet her, she says my dad is there too. They're quick to spit out asking if I'm okay, what I'm doing. I tell them, yeah, of course, I haven't left the house and we just finished a movie. They tell me that while they and my dog were in the kitchen, a wooden plaque my sister made for me with my name on it and a stick from my university fell into the centre of my bedroom. I think I should note that both of these things have been sitting untouched, securely placed on a shelf in my room for the better part of two years. I have no clue what's going on here and if I should be worried for my family or not. Does this sound like something we need to address or could it be something peaceful? I've had connections like hearing my deceased grandmother's and guardian angel Christmas bells playing a few years ago when they most certainly weren't, but never seen anything or have things move before this past November. We've lived in this house for almost 20 years. My granny had been fighting cancer on top of other illnesses since I was 15. She always feared when she got old we'd leave her in a home. She and her brothers and sisters always discussed each year who was going to die. And they were always right. And she's been saying for almost three years it was her time to go. We always used to tell her to stop saying that because she was still young. She was going to live for ages. But it almost felt like she knew it was her time to go. She was diagnosed with bone cancer shortly after and the treatments began. IVs, blood transfusions, chemo. We live in a desert town smack in the middle of California so everything is hours away. 
We used to have to travel hours just to sit at the doctors for maybe 30 minutes and drive back. You can imagine how tiring it would be on someone in such a position. She decided to move a few cities over closer to better hospitals. We were all happy for her. She eventually moved and months later broke the news she was going to have heart valve surgery and deal with the cancer. After her surgery, she came out strong. We were all happy to see her pull through. I remember her calling my name when she got out over the phone. Bubba, where's Bubba? Tell him I love him. Weeks pass, months even, things start to happen. Seizures, bleeding, random illnesses, she would have constant seizures, but always seemed to recover from them. One day, it was different. This time she has a seizure and stroke and was found by my cousin on the floor, barely moving. Black and blue, rushed to the hospital later, finding she suffered from pneumonia. She was in a coma. When she finally opened her eyes, she looked at my cousin and started screaming. Bubba, where is he? When I heard her, I thought there was hope. But eventually, she told the nurses she wanted to die at home. She was moved to her home and not even said later we all planned to see her. But the bad luck ensued and the car broke down. Our money drained. Our family members left without us. We had to watch her suffer from dementia asking who we are. Growing weaker and paler by the day, she eventually passed. But she came to say goodbye to me. Later that night, I went to sleep and appeared in a field of yellow, beautiful flowers with this circle in the middle of it. I assumed it were another vivid dream. I went to the middle of the field, dealing every step and sat down in the middle of this gigantic field. And suddenly, a woman appeared. This big hazel eyes, head to her shoulders, very petite in white shirt and jeans. Something I've never seen in my life. I looked over and saw what I thought were my mom, uncle and cousin. The lady looked directly at me with a smile and said, Tell your mom and everyone I never held anything against you. I love all of you. I'm someone I've never seen. I remember in the dream I was confused, staring at her before saying, I love you too. I'm glad to see you happy. And seconds later she gave me a smile and disappeared. A face full of tears in my dreams. Awaken with a face full of tears, knowing who it was. I told my cousin and she sent a photo of my granny in her high school years. It was her coming back to say goodbye. My granny always knew things a living being shouldn't. She would have severe migraines before a family member passed. And it's always him on the dot. I've always had multiple dreams like these and always thought I was crazy. But it brings me happiness knowing I can still talk to her. This happened way back in 1989 or 1990. At the time I lived in Santa Fe, Texas, and drove my then boyfriend back and forth to work. It was getting close to sunset and, as evening is my favourite time of the day, I had parked facing the west between a low-roofed building and some kind of structure, something like a radio tower with a blinking red light at the top. While drinking my usual coffee, I noticed some movement in the distance. I thought it might be some herons and became more interested since I like watching large birds fly. The closer they got, however, the less they looked the birds of any kind. As I watched them come into view, it turned out that what I was looking at wasn't anything living. At least not how we think of things that are flesh and blood. These were just balls. Five chrome balls about three to four feet in diameter. Perfectly round, flying in V formation. They were gliding silently and steadily along. No variation in space or speed in any direction. Just staying the course roughly 50 feet above ground. As they got above the truck I was driving, I sat on the door's window opening and watched as they flew past and right in line with the road behind me. It was so amazing and confusing, I had to resist the almost overwhelming urge to start the truck and follow them to wherever they were going. My eyes never left them except to blink. The entire time watching was spent trying to identify what the hell they were. It's never far from my mind for long, and it drives me crazy sometimes. 
I've never heard of anything similar. Has anyone experienced anything like that? Anyone in the area that may have seen the same thing? It was around rush hour, so I think there weren't many looking up at the sky. My house is right near a nature reservation, so I see a lot of wildlife throughout the year. Deer, wild turkey, even the occasional bear. However, we've been having really cold weather and snow, and haven't seen a lot of wildlife since. That is, until this morning. I had to work early today, and was leaving the house around 6am, when I noticed something moving around towards the back of the property, where we have a barn about 150 feet back. Right next to the barn was what looked like a large fox making its way across the snow. This wouldn't be that unusual, except for the fact that it was walking through the snow on its hind legs in a super awkward and unnatural looking way. As soon as I spotted the thing, I froze and couldn't look away. The animal kept moving without noticing me and crossed my yard, disappearing behind the neighbor's shed. I immediately got shivers all over and had really bad vibes from the fox. I've never seen anything paranormal before in my life, but the way that fox was moving looked so unnatural that I can't believe it's just a result of injury or something. Definitely going to think twice before walking the dog back there anytime soon. I've seen a few things, but this one is easy to tell. Me and my girlfriend at the time shared an apartment. It was morning and something woke me up. Kind of like when you're asleep and someone walks in the room but doesn't make a sound. But you feel their presence. You know, it's like the air in the room changes. So I woke up and looked to the bedroom door out of reflex. Even though she and I were the only people there and I knew that. Well, no one was there, of course. So I looked at Laura's back. It's around 9.30am, springtime, and we have the sliding door to the patio partially open on our second floor apartment, and we were both naked under the covers, and my glance moved from the doorway to her back, and right then, it was like a clear, wispy shape got up out of her, same size as her, she was really short, put its feet on the floor like you do when you first get out of bed, pushed itself up into a standing position, and then walked straight towards the bathroom. As it's getting close to the bathroom, really only four to five steps, it started kind of dissipating in a kind of shimmery way. Not light shimmery, but kind of fading wispy. Same body type like her, same gait. But I remember specifically thinking it had no hair. And the impression I got at the time was I saw her or a part of her, or her spirit or astral body or something, or a spirit that lived in her, get up and walk away. This was in El Paso, and I had several encounters with people who practice Santeria, and a couple encounters with people who practice other forms of magic. So I waited for her to leave for work, and I immediately got down and looked for some eggs or something under the bed. Nothing there. Never brought it up to her. So there it is. Saw a five foot nothing clear shape get it out of my girlfriend and go to the bathroom. I come from a remote island called Rendover, located in the Solomon Islands, and have since moved overseas. Across from our island is another island, called Tetapare. The story of Tetapare is really interesting, because it was abandoned completely by the inhabitants a few centuries ago. Just like that, the villagers fled the island, to come to neighbouring islands such as my own, and here we're a few centuries later. Because of the lack of humans on the island, it's known for its biodiversity, and a few researchers come every now and again to have a look. The interesting part of Tetapare, for me, was why did everyone just leave? If you were a villager back in the days, it would have been a great place to live. Volcanic soil to grow crops, an abundance of fresh water, animals easy to hunt. The official story told is that there was a great sickness, and people were dropping like flies left and right. So the villagers fled to get away from the sick. However, 
The island is known to be very big, so realistically, if you wanted to get away from others, it wouldn't be too hard, because you could be self-sufficient on other parts of the islands. The story told to me growing up is a little bit different. Back in those days, we loved to fight. A war canoe from my island Rendover arrived on Tetapari to fight. However, upon arrival, they were met with numerous unburied dead bodies. All the large canoes that belonged to the Tetapari people were gone. To leave so hastily and not even bury your dead properly is a really weird thing. Because it was back in the days the first thought was a spirit had done this to these people. However, the people from Rendova decided to set up villages against best judgement. In due time, they also fled because a spirit that had decimated the population of Tetapari apparently attacked the newly set up villages there. Ever since, the island has continued to remain uninhabited, except for the few ecologists that tourists come visit at. Nowadays, we go to Tetapari to maybe have a picnic or go hunting. We are, however, extremely cautious, because it's believed the island is still extremely wild, and because of the lack of humans, spirits run amok on the island. I have some weird stories about going hunting there if anyone wants to hear them, but that can be a story for another time. The island is said to be still wild, because no church has been built on it yet. For this reason, spirits still roam free. Ever since I was small, we went hunting on Tetapari. They have an issue with wild boars destroying the natural habitat, so hunting is encouraged. As a result of chasing boars around the island, I have a pretty good knowledge of where things are. A few years ago when I was younger, while we were hunting, we decided to go visit our other relatives at the Eco Lodge. Recommend visiting it if you want a unique experience. There was a researcher who wanted to go have a look at the unique flora and fauna. Since I was the only one who spoke English somewhat fluently, they told me to take him. We explored the island quite extensively. The thing is, we know when we're hunting. We don't go into the deep rainforest because you may not come out. Simply because of its density, but also because there have been stories of other things. Anyways, I was taking this researcher around and he had a navigational piece of equipment. He was using to see where we were going. The day was nearing the end and I wanted to go walk back to the eco lodge because I didn't want to be camping in the middle of the night without shelter. The way we normally do things is we come back out from the rainforest to the coast to walk to places, simply because we don't want to get lost in the rainforest. Anyways, I knew where we were, and I knew the way to the coast and told the researcher, let's get going this way. This is where things get weird. His device was saying the coast was in a completely different direction from where I knew the direction to the coast was. Now I've heard stories when people go hunting about losing their mind and going straight into the rainforest and never coming back out. At that point, I had to question my own brain because what his device was saying was completely different from what I knew. But I knew at that moment that it may be his device playing up, and I didn't want to take the risk of disappearing into the rainforest because of this device. I had walked this forest thousands of times, so I decided to instead trust my gut. I told the researcher that I thought his device was not correct. He didn't like the sound of that at all, and tried to argue with me that I was wrong. I knew something was wrong and I didn't want to spend my time arguing and wanted to get out of the area ASAP. So I basically told him, I'm going to go the way I know to the coast. You can follow your device if you want to, but I'm not following you because if you're wrong, we may die. For generations, Giants have been at the center of heaps and stories. From the giants that disrupted villages to the ones that would steal people at night to eat them, we have a ton. Last year, when I was back, I was talking to our spiritual man. They believe our ancestors gave him gifts that connect to the supernatural side. And he told me a more recent story. So apparently, a family from another village had contacted him about their daughter missing to see if it was something supernatural. 
Now our spiritual man investigated and came to the conclusion that a giant had taken her. He asked the village if they had a giant population and they verified that they lived in a cave not too far away. So he goes to investigate the cave. From the outside, it looked like a completely normal cave, he said. And when you went inside, nothing looked unusual. But before giving up on the lead, he decided to try a blood sacrifice to see if it would trigger something. He rounded up three pigs and slaughtered them at the front of the cave, pouring their blood out. He said he waited a bit and decided to go in. Sure enough, when he went inside the cave had changed completely and there were stairs leading down. My guy went down the stairs deeper into the cave. He said the plants he saw in the cave were unlike anything he had seen before. He mentioned them glowing in the dark and it was one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen. He eventually went further and further down and sure enough there was a giant on a throne. The giant thanked him for the sacrifice and asked him what he wanted. He mentioned the girl and the giant king knew what he was talking about. He demanded the girl come out and she appeared. The giant explained that one of his family members had taken a liking to her because she was so beautiful and kidnapped her. So my spiritual guy asks for her back and the giant agrees and lets him take her back. She gets returned to her village. That's all for the story. So the land we live on in my islands is somewhat cursed for anyone who isn't in our tribe or closely related to us. Our ancestors obtained the land through a lot of bloodshed with other tribes. In the time before, there were a lot of other people living on the island, but tribal wars killed quite a bit of the population. People who aren't us or related to us say they feel an extreme feeling of dread when they walk through the bush. To avoid this, my grandmother used to go into the forest herself when a new person came to visit us and talk to our ancestral spirits to say leave them alone. After my grandmother passed away, we forgot to do this and learnt the hard way why we need to still practice the old ways. My cousin had gotten herself a new boyfriend, who we'll call Alan, and they decided to come visit us. Because my grandmother had passed away, no one had gone to the forest to warn our ancestors of his coming. Alan was extremely scared to travel anywhere by himself in our rainforest. He said no matter what, he felt like something was watching him and he had his breath in his throat the whole time. Alan would frequently get chills even when he was sitting next to a fire. One time, we went through the walking through the rainforest with Alan and we came across an old place where we used to sacrifice our enemies to our old gods. We all stepped on the stone where they beheaded our enemies and Alan stepped on the stone and immediately fainted. We took him back to our leaf hut immediately. At that point, everyone figured Alan was just sick, but one night, something made me realise what was actually happening. I woke up to someone tapping me. I thought it was my sister, but I looked and it was a man from before. He was dressed in our traditional clothing from before and he had a bone through his nose. At this point, I'm completely terrified, but the man says something to calm me down. He says, Ito, which means daughter in our language. I, at this point, realise that this is probably one of our ancestors. He then proceeds to say, who is this man staying with you? I explain that it's my cousin's boyfriend and he nods. He says he has to go and walks to the door and completely vanishes. After that, I explained to my uncle what had happened and he told me that he thought the old ways had died with my grandmother, but it's apparent we still need to practice it for the sake of our guests. After the man visited me and I explained who Alan was, Alan became a lot more comfortable and found the feeling of dread gone. I grew up on this island called Rendover in the Solomon Islands, which was completely isolated due to lack of modern technology. I lived with my grandmother, who was considered to be able to talk to the spirits. Many weird things happened when I was growing up, but this is my most vivid story I remember. 
We had a little farm to grow our cassava and taro, and my grandmother and I went up nearly every day to work on it and harvest food for dinner. I was only four at the time, but I was my grandmother's little helper. At one point, my grandmother noticed that some of our crops were missing and decided to plant our ancestral ginger there. This ginger, as weird as it sounds, is said to have a demon we used to sacrifice to the inside of it that protects us. She planted it there to ensure whoever was stealing our crops would get caught. One afternoon, we're sitting at our leaf hut and this man comes down from the path of our little farm. He's shivering and is disoriented. My grandmother at this point realised that he was the one who stole our crops and decided to help him and hopefully he'll learn this lesson. She orders me to make a fire and I start making one while she goes and gets the man to sit next to him. He's still shivering next to the fire and so I get blankets and cover him but he's still cold. My grandmother and I sit next to him and she starts talking to him but not talking to him. She says something along the lines of it's time to come out now, leave him alone. I never forget how the man replied. It was the most demonic, low sounding voice I had heard in my life. And the man replied with, I don't want to come out, he's mine now. So at this point, I'm beyond scared. And my grandmother tells me to go get my uncles to come and hold him down. I go and get them and they hold the man down in a laying down position. My grandmother then starts doing a pulling motion just above the man's body and he starts screaming. My grandmother keeps going regardless of the scream and repeats the process for about half an hour. Eventually the man collapses and my grandmother says she's got to go into the forest to finish the rest of the ritual. She instructs me to stay with the man till he wakes up and give him some stew, so I do. The man wakes up and is completely confused about where he is. I asked him if he remembers anything and all he said he remembers was intense pain. I send him off on his way back to his home village and my grandmother comes back a little later with a ginger she has to plant. Nevertheless, the man learned his lesson and never stole from us again. This is going back about 10 years ago. I should point out, I seem to be a beacon for the paranormal and have had many experiences in my life. This house was by far the strangest. I live in a low socio-economic city and the rental vacancy rate is usually 1% or lower. So when you need a rental, you kind of just pick a house you don't hate too much and hope for the best. I was living with my mum at the time, my brother, sister and my sister's son. I managed to find a private rental with a lovely couple. The house was at the good end of a bad street and was probably about 25 years old at the time. It was quite spacious and modern and was the first house I'd ever rented with an aircon. Fancy. To give a visual idea of the home, it kind of has two fronts which are both kind of also block backs. On one side, backs onto the start of the highway in cane fields. The other side backs onto a quiet street in a park. The highway side has a fenced yard and a covered patio. The street side has an enclosed but open outdoor space with another separate enclosed outdoor space that housed the landlord's spa, which we weren't allowed to use. Off this outdoor area was a large kind of fancy garage that could house two cars. Inside that was a door to a tool shed and inside that was a strange little creepy room that always gave me bad vibes. It had old tools in it. I always tried not to go in there because it just felt too weird. Not long after we moved in, I constantly felt like I was being watched by a young girl, who I always felt was around the spa garage area of the home. I never actually saw her, but it always felt like she was watching me. That was as strange as it got until a poor little girl was murdered in my city. It seemed to trigger something in the home, I feel. One night, I was in my bedroom and a statue of my shelf flew across the room at crazy speed and hit the wall. It somehow didn't break despite being quite delicate. Then one morning, my then boyfriend dropped me home around 2am. It had been a hectic night studying at uni, so I got home pretty late. 
I opened the gate to the outdoor area. This is on the quiet side of the house. As the outdoor area wrapped around the house, I could see all the house lights were on in every room. It wasn't too strange a thing, as my mum and brother were total night hawks at the time, and I figured they were both still awake. I put my hand on the doorknob to open it, pushed the door open, and the house was pitch black. When I investigated, my whole family was fast asleep and in their rooms. There's just no way they could have magically turned off all the lights in that split second. I was so baffled that after that I made my boyfriend stay with me as I went into my house every time he dropped me back late. The next experience was when I actually saw a shadow person in my room. I should add, I'd been having dreams about a teenage boy in kind of 80s looking clothes who kept talking to me about his mum in a rather distressed way. He kept showing me a 70s or 80s style sedan in the dream and a gravestone. It got so weird that I asked an old neighbour if there'd ever been a boy killed in a crash, as he always pointed towards one particular road near the nearby cane fields. The neighbour said they didn't remember any such crash. I was again baffled. Enter the shadow dude who I think was the boy. I woke up around 4am and it was only slightly light. I thought my brother was in my room as I saw a thin male figure looking around my room, as if he was looking for something or curious. I immediately said, what are you looking for? The figure turned around, kind of startled, and I could see it wasn't my brother, but a shadowy mass with no real features. He walked out the room, but and this was so creepy. He peeked his head around the door frame once before he walked out towards the lounge room, which is to the opposite side to my brother's room. Just to be sure, I checked my brother's room and he was fast asleep. Eventually, the house was sold and we had to move. This is where all the dots started to connect. I work at a paper and we have history books filled with snippets of old news stories. I read one snippet about an 80s murder-suicide in a town between a mother and her young son and daughter. It was reported in the same suburb, but details were a bit vague, so I wondered if it was linked and forgot all about it. Fast forward a while, and I'm dating a different guy. At one stage, we were driving out near the cane fields in the general area of the house, and we both simultaneously said, Do you feel that? It's like bad energy. We pulled over for a moment, and then he said he needed to get out of there, and I agreed. I have no idea why my partner at the time was involved in these experiences, but at one stage he was looking for a share house and told me he'd seen this one place that had such bad energy he couldn't stand being there. I asked him details and eventually we found out it was the exact house I had been living in. I hadn't even told him about my time there so there's no way he'd have known. So one day I go looking through microfilm at the library searching for old history news as we often do flashback stories. I came by the story of the murder-suicide. Turns out it was two doors down from where I lived. The mother is believed to have killed or drugged the children, loaded them into the car, then headed out towards the cane fields where she carried it out. The car in the photo was the exact one that the boy had shown me, and the place it was found was in the direction he had pointed. Their house had been in the same direction, that I kept feeling the young girl around. I don't know if they visited the house I lived in. There's every chance they knew the owners at the time and had spent time there. Or perhaps two doors down isn't that far in terms of the spirit world. I did drive back past after I found out to tell the two kids I was sorry for what had happened to them. It also explained why the activity happened after another child was senselessly murdered. I think it upset them to think that it happened to someone else. I've noticed the home seems to change hands a lot, so I'm not sure if everyone there gets haunted or if it's just coincidence. So two nights ago, my grandfather passed away suddenly. Well, it was suddenly to us, but typical John, not wanting to make his business other people's concerns, swore my grandma to secrecy over the last six months and didn't want anyone to know he was sick. My parents' house is currently under construction, important to the story, and he was always coming over all of a sudden, helping out with chores and talking about how he was getting old and doesn't have much time left 
but it didn't seem out of character at the time. Anyway, last night I slept at my parents' house with my dog, Harvey. During the construction, my mum and I slept in my room, and my dad slept in the basements. Around 5am, Harvey woke me up, whimpering at the door. He doesn't need to go outside. When he does, he just sits directly on my chest. He was definitely fixated on something, but I eventually got him to go back to bed. Then, I kept hearing the sound of water running in the bathroom. I knew it wasn't my mom, who was asleep next to me. And it couldn't have been my dad, because there was a bathroom in the basement. I get up around 6am, and my dad comes in the kitchen, and asks what the hell Harvey was doing this morning. I told him we just got up five minutes ago. The house is open concept, so there's literally one big space that currently only has three patio chairs, and a couch covered with a tarp. So it's super echoey, and the floors are very creaky. If anyone is walking through there, you can hear it anywhere in the house. My dad walks over to the chairs and starts to rock them back and forth. You were knocking these chairs around like this, and moving the couch around. He even knew exactly which chairs made each sound, and that it went on for at least ten minutes. I explained to him that Mom, Harvey and I were all sleeping, and that the chairs and couch were all in the same spot they were in last night. I know, because I put them in a formation to create a puppy barrier. I told him I didn't hear anything like that, but I did hear the water running in the bathroom. Then it dawns on him. If someone was up, dog or human, where were their footsteps? For the last 20 years or so, my career has been motor vehicle related. I've held various fleet management and coordination roles with a number of large and or international companies. One such employer was a government department. Around 2005, the UK government decided to set up a dedicated force to patrol England's motorways to keep them hazard free. They were called Highways Agency Traffic Officers, known internally as HATO. We used several sites around the country to train the new traffic officers defensive driving skills, as well as how to deal with the various situations they would expect to encounter in their new roles. These sites were almost exclusively disused World War II airfields, as we could paint mock motorways on the old runways for the training, and use a hangar to securely store the vehicles in between training sessions. At Throckmorton Airfield, we used Hangar 1. It's a big hangar. We usually had a total of 15 Land Rovers and Ni Nissan Pathfinders located at this site. And even with them all spaced out in the hangar, I reckon we'd only occupied a third of its floor space. I turned up early one morning between training sessions to do an inventory of the vehicles and their contents, brushes, traffic cones, spill kits, etc. It was barely 6am on a cold March morning. I had a five minute chat with Darren, the airfield manager, to let him know I was on site. Made myself a cup of tea in his office kitchen and jumped back in my car to drive down to Hangar 1. I remember it was raining, and light rain. I'd set off from my home in Basingstoke a little after 4.30am and had driven through patches of thick fog most of the way to the airfield. And I especially remember wondering if this was going to be the type of weather I could expect for the rest of the day. I unlocked the big roller doors and rolled one open enough to drive my car in and closed the door behind me. The 15 or so vehicles were lined up against the wall, rears nearest the wall, all facing inwards. I parked up, switched the hangar lights on, grabbed my travel mug of hot tea, priorities, and my clipboard. And for the next 40 minutes or so, set about checking tyre tread depths, lights, and inventorying the contents of the vehicles. I was maybe halfway done with my head in the back of a Pathfinder, counting collapsible signs, when I heard a thick northern accent boom out, okay, give it a try now. My immediate thought was, who the fuck is that? I walk between the vehicles until I'm abreast at the front of the vehicles and can clearly see into the rest of the hangar. Hello? I called out. Nothing. Silence. You know the saying of when the silence is deafening? That's what I experienced at that moment, and it filled me with dread. It scared me. I called out again. Is anybody there? I feel rattled and I don't know why. 
my gut is screaming at me to run. And I learned at a young age to trust my gut. I sprinted down the row of checkered high-vis SUVs and leaped into my car, stopping only to open the roller door wide enough to get the car out and, wheel spinning on the wet tarmac, hightail it to Darren's office at the gay house. Darren told me a couple of months later at my next visit that when I appeared in his office doorway, I was as white as a sheath and shaking. I remember it somewhat differently. As I remember it, I casually walked into his office and plonked myself on the old sofa in the corner. Darren reckoned he had to take my arm and guide me to the sofa. I do, however, correctly remember his question. Did you see something? Or was it the voice? Darren made me an Irish tea that was heavy on the Irish and told me that a few of the hangers have paranormal tenants. But hangar one was by far the most active. He explained that from what he'd been told during the war, a couple of mechanics were working on an engine of a Wellington bomber. One was up on the wing and the other was underneath, on the ground. The one on the wing said to his mates, Okay, try it now. And when the other one tried to spin the prop, the engine caught immediately, which he wasn't expecting. He overbalanced and fell into the now fast spinning blades, which made very short work of him. Darren couldn't explain the malevolence the hangar has, but I wasn't the first to be terrified in Hangar 1, and I'm sure there will have been more after me. Unfortunately, I still had a job to do. So after a while, once my nerves had calmed down, I had to drive back and finish my inventory. But you can bet, I kept that roller door open and the engine of my car idling. It was early autumn in 1999, and I was camping with friends in the West Country, UK. There were about six of us. We had set up our tents alongside a little stream, but decided that we would walk the mile or so back to the local village and have dinner at the local pub. It was a beautiful evening, roughly 6pm, still bright daylight and still warm. We were walking down the country lane with hedgerows and pastures beyond them on either side of us. I was walking with my friend Dave, chatting about whatever. We were at the head of the group, with the rest a few metres behind us. Dave is on my left, and as we're walking and talking, we come to a metal gate, also on the left, leading into the field. There's this farmer leaning against the gate with a genial smile on his face. He looks friendly and, to be honest, harmless, maybe in his 50s or 60s. But what struck me most was what he was wearing. He had on rough cotton or maybe woolen dark brown trousers, an old style white cotton shirt and an old scruffy black waistcoat. He seemed to be staring and as we draw, he says, evening. I replied. Dave looks at me and then looks to our left. In the meantime, the farmer has said something about the weather and I reply that it's perfect for camping. We don't stop walking or slow our already slow pace. I once a few metres away, turn to Dave and say, did you see what he was wearing? Like it was the 1940s or something. Dave turned to me with a confused look on his face. Who? Who were you just talking to? I turn to gesture to the farmer, but he's not there. And judging by the rest of the group behind us, who were just passing the gate themselves, nobody else saw or interacted with the farmer. I've had various experiences throughout my life that I can't logically explain, but today I'm going to tell you about the house my parents bought when I was in my teens. This isn't about one encounter like most of the other posts will be, but rather a number of the more memorable things that happened to me in this house. This is in the UK. I don't know many details on how my parents acquired a large Victorian three-story house in St. Nicholas Road. What I do know is that a builder had bought it and was converting it to apartments, and he ran out of money. So the bank foreclosed and somehow, my parents acquired it for much cheaper. But it was a building site. The builder hadn't done much work to the ground floor, but the other two floors were pretty much just shells. Structurally, the house was absolutely fine. It dated from around the 1880s. 
My dad asked me if I'd stay there so that people could see it was occupied, so that people wouldn't break in or squat. I set myself up in the main living area with a camp bed, and all was good. I had electricity and hot water, and despite its condition, the house was sealed from the weather. My first few experiences were hearing doors being opened and closed in other rooms. Of course, when I got there, I wouldn't find anybody or anything untoward, or indeed any reason for the doors to just magically open or close. These were proper old woman doors, and not likely to move in a draft. Not that there were any drafts in any case, the builder had replaced all the old window frames with good quality UPVC framed double glazing. The sounds of doors opening and closing when I was alone in the house became a common thing in my three years of living there. After my parents had put right all of the builder's work, decorated, and the rest of the family moved in, my parents, my sister, and briefly my brother, until he got a place with his girlfriend. I ended up having the top floor to myself. The house had six bedrooms, four bedrooms and the family bathroom on the first floor, and two bedrooms and a sort of kitchenette area on the second floor, which was the top floor, my floor. One room faced the street and was a bit noisy due to the traffic outside, and the other overlooked the back of the house and was much quieter. I set myself up in the back bedroom, but would soon be woken regularly by an animal panting next to my head. I found out after a while that the last occupant was an old man who had a German shepherd dog. Another thing I often heard in that room was creaking wood and a rustling noise, like paper. I figured that someone used to have a creaky wooden chair or a rocking chair and would read the newspaper here. I tried moving to the front bedroom, but the noise of the traffic was too much in the summer with the window open, and having it closed made the room unbearably hot and stuffy. So I soon moved back into the back bedroom and talked to the room about the dog waking me up, and to please try to keep him quiet. I was still woken occasionally by panting noises, but it was a lot less frequently. One of the weirder things that started happening, I actually wasn't aware of until after about two years of living there. It had started slowly and built up over time. It was only when I moved out that I realised what was happening. I started to hear voices, several, like there was a group of people in the room with me and they were having a conversation or quiet get-together. I don't know why, but to this day, whenever I think about this, I picture them in 1930s style, but I've nothing to base this on that I'm aware of. It could be a couple of words. A snatch of conversation, usually male, but not always. And background noise, like glasses chinking, or a record player or similar party-style noises. And laughter. I would often just hear good-natured laughter with men's voices. I talked to my dad about this because it was becoming a weekly thing and I honestly began to wonder if I was going a bit mad. He told me he hadn't heard voices but did admit that he had had other things happen to him that didn't happen to me. It was only when I moved out and into my new place that I realised after a couple of weeks that I hadn't heard any of the voices. The realisation made me laugh with joy. I wasn't losing my marbles at all. The ground floor was made up of the two main living areas, the large kitchen, the laundry room, and at the very back of the house, a room that had been converted into a shower room and toilet. I have no idea what the room was prior to the conversion. I was in the kitchen one day, I think it was a Saturday, and I clearly heard a young female voice say, the potatoes from the Crescent aren't as good as they used to be. The Crescent is the local high street of the area, about a five minute walk from the house. The voice was clear as crystal and came from the adjoining laundry room. I dashed in there, but of course, there's nobody there. I stick my head in the shower and toilet room, but that's empty too. I, of course, am alone in the house. This one is a tale my sister told me. Her and her boyfriend of the time had rolled in from the pub late one Saturday night and were in the kitchen unpacking the takeaways they'd grabbed on their way home. When her boyfriend casually says to her, Oh, I don't know you had your grandmother staying with you. Sister gave him a weird look and said, Both my grannies are dead. To which he replied, Then who the fuck is that? They both look into the hallway and there's nothing there. Boyfriend squealed and screamed and ran into the laundry. Once he calmed down, he told my sister how he'd heard someone go, Shh, that's him. He turned towards the noise and there was a white-haired old lady 
looking over the banister of the staircase in the hallway and scowling at him like they'd woken her up. My dad was as much a sceptic of the paranormal as I am, or was, and admitted that a few strange things had happened to him. He told me of when he was preparing food in the kitchen one time and put a utensil he was using down on the countertop, only to reach for it again 20 seconds later, and it had gone. He had looked on the floor and started looking elsewhere, trying to figure out where it had gone. He found it in a mug of water in the sink and knew for a fact that he didn't put it there. Another one he told me was that he was reading or doing paperwork at the dinner table in one of the living areas when the door slammed shut, which startled him out of his concentration. He looked up to see the handle turn downwards and the door to open again fully. There was nobody on the other side of the door. This was back in 2006 and 7 in the UK. I had bought a house with my girlfriend at the time. The house was an ex-council property built in the 70s. It was alright. Needed some very minor work done to it, but that's all. The girlfriend and I moved in straight away and without drama. However, after a couple of weeks, we noticed things would go missing, only to reappear after a few days on the second to bottom step of the stairs. Usually, it was kitchen implements, and I always got the blame, as the girlfriend didn't believe in ghosts. This became the standard state of play for about 12 months. Something would disappear. She'd get the strop at me. I'd quietly ask the house to please return the item, because I'm in the shit again, and she withholds sex when she's annoyed at me. Item would reappear a few days later, and then all would be well for a month or six weeks, until something else disappears. Rinse and repeat. And then one day, her phone disappeared. This is back in 2006, remember? So mobile phones were nothing like the supercomputers they are now. It was usually in her pocket or her bag, and she couldn't understand where it went. We searched everywhere. It was switched on, so we tried calling it but couldn't hear anything, even though it was doing so at my end. Of course, it was my fault. I quietly pleaded to the house to return the phone, but as usual, I was ignored. It was a Saturday morning when it reappeared. For whatever reason, the girlfriend was up before me and had gone down for brekkie and to put the kettle on. I heard her go, oh, and come back up the stairs immediately, clutching her phone. Why did you put it on the step, she asked me. I explained that it's not me doing it. We looked at her phone, full battery. Unusual, it had been missing for five days, and dozens of missed calls from my mobile and her office number. And one outgoing call was made. We tried redialing it, but it was a dead line. It wasn't the last thing to disappear before we sold the house in 2010, but it was definitely the most memorable. My family and I moved into a new house my senior year of high school, and my room was in the basement. My room in the last house was in the basement, so it was no big deal for me. There was another room next to mine that could have been another bedroom, but everyone else decided to stay upstairs. My family put our piano in that room and used the closet as extra storage space. Every time I'd walk past that room, I was filled with inexplicable dread. It's a feeling I still can't describe properly. I always felt like there was something on the other side of the door that was just waiting for me to open it. If I would walk by that room and the door was open, I would walk up and shut it immediately and being sure not to look inside. No other room in the house or any other houses I've had lived in has given me this feeling. I felt a presence that was extremely negative in that room. It came to a point where every time I went into my room, which shared a wall with that room, I felt uneasy, watched, unsafe and overall very negative. I would have written it off as me being paranoid or anxious about moving into a new house after living in the same one most of my life. However, I wasn't the only one who expressed these feelings. A woman who cleaned our house refused to clean that room one day, and when my mom asked her why, she said that the room had an extremely dark energy. I wish I knew what was going on in that house. Items would disappear and reappear. Lights would be turned on, 
when I was sure they were off. Doors would be open, I was sure had been closed, etc, etc. I won't ever go back into that house my family moved to after about two years. So a little backstory. This happened on Sunday around 2.30 or 3am. I work nights mostly, so I'm usually up at night. I was the only one in my household at the time, and I live in an apartment complex. I was crouched in the doorway to my balcony at the time, petting my rabbit because he wanted some loving, and I let him free roam on the balcony. Anyways, as I said, I was crouched and since there isn't any railing, no one would be able to see me. And even if they could, there's a giant tree that covers half my balcony. And the light was off since it was so late at night. That being said, I heard a giggle and then my name being called. It was being called in a coaxing kind of way, like someone trying to get you to come over. I stood and looked around at the other balconies and then the ground floor and didn't see a single person. I then thought I might have called someone by accident because the voice almost sounded like a friend of mine and I had just plugged in my phone. So I closed the door and checked, but I hadn't. The moment I closed the door, I heard the voice say my name one last time in an angry tone, and then silence. Thankfully, I haven't heard it since, and I told my sister, who then sprinkled salt in the doorways, and told whatever it was that it wasn't welcome in the morning, in case it was a spirit, I guess. I really can't explain it. I've had a lot of paranormal-like experiences in my life, including always feeling like someone's watching me at night, and hearing noises when I'm home alone since I was young. But I've never outright heard my name being called like that. I live less than half a mile away from a densely wooded area, with an 1800s era graveyard which I frequently go to, mainly looking for mushrooms and reptiles and such. But the past few times I've been, and the very last time I went, have been exceptionally strange. I'll start with the most interesting thing to happen first. I had gone to this graveyard roughly around 2pm, again, looking for mushrooms. I was roughly 400 feet into the woods, far past the graveyard, which is only about 20 to 30 feet from the entrance to the woods, when I decided to head back to my house. So I began to walk back toward the way I had entered, when I started to get the feeling that I was being watched. Now being in the woods, that wasn't quite a normal thing. It usually just ends up being a deer or owl or something. However, I quickly realised it probably wasn't. When I finally got back to the area of the graveyard, the woods went dead silent, which isn't a good thing. So I ran pretty quickly out of the woods. The moment I stepped out of the woods, I looked to the right of me and I saw a trail that I hadn't seen before. So I decided to, quite stupidly, go into the trail to see what was back there. And there wasn't much. Just rusted cans and trash everywhere. I had stood back in this area where the short trail took me when I heard a very strange sound. It sounded almost like a frog, but very high pitched and almost tonal, like someone singing. That made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. At this point, I sprinted out of the woods until I was nearly back to my neighborhood when I looked back. And when I did, there were three small orbs that seemed to stare back at me. At that moment, I just said to myself, oh, fuck this, and ran as fast as I could back into my neighborhood. The only other strange thing to happen back there is the Sasquatch trees, which are bent over trees that I know for certain that no human could have bent. The trees back there are over 20 feet in height and quite sturdy. And the time where I was back in the graveyard with my mother, and we both heard a distinctive whoop, like the stereotypical sounds you hear on the Bigfoot documentaries. It was really quite strange. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and me and my family had some old family friends over at our house. We had been hanging out nearly all day, and it was beginning to get around the time of sunset. Me and my friend who I'll refer to as A, 
went on a walk down to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes. Just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we began the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky which appears to be moving. I tell A this and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway looking up at the sky. We watch the star for roughly five minutes and then we notice two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. A pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see it, sadly. Nearly immediately after A had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars and formed a large triangle. The stars then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping and then proceeded to move at a speed which I have never seen before, away from each other and disappearing into the night. Both me and A were visibly shook up, based on the reactions of the people at my home, and when we tried to explain what had happened to them, they shrugged it off as just us not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, so does A. pitch black humanoid figure, wearing neat clothes and hair by the seams. I can't see detail besides the outline. He's about six feet, and I'm the only one to have seen it. First time was when I was like five or so. I saw the figure very clearly walking towards me down the hall, at my grandmother's house interstate. And after I froze, I ran off and it disappeared. But I don't know if it's because I was a kid or what, but it gave me a very bad feeling. Then again, when I was about 12, I was looking out my back window into the paddock behind my house. The figure was walking horizontally to me and then turned and continued walking towards me. I stared for a second with that same scared feeling and then went to run off. But after a couple of steps, I decided to stop and look back and it was gone. Those are my two major experiences that I know wasn't just me seeing things because I watched it clearly. I've also found that my mother has seen it standing behind me whilst I was on the couch and it promptly disappeared. Turns out my mum's old friend saw the same thing happen. A black human-like figure behind me and just disappeared. On a separate occasion. And she didn't know about the possibility of there being something following me. So I'm not the only person to have seen the figure. It gives me a bad feeling, but that could be just because I'm seeing something or what. My mum reckons it's this ghost named Gary that we encountered when I was a newborn following me. It woke mum up in time for my appointment and told her his name, but he was good and didn't feel it. I've had other occasions where I think it's around because I get that same feeling, scared and weirdly aware of what's around me. As I've gotten older and moved, it seems to be less apparent, but I still have occasions where I think I might catch a glimpse or feel its presence. I don't know if, like me, you have a big family. My nan had eight children and she herself had many siblings, one of which was my great uncle P. Uncle P was my mum's favourite uncle. By now he was in his 90s, but happy and living life to the full still. I'd met him as a child of course, but living in different cities meant that as I grew up, I heard a lot about him but never actually saw him. Mum said that Uncle P always asked about me. He wasn't too bothered about the others because I think I was always fascinated by him and when he called my mum, I would always butt in to say hi and ask after him. Sadly, he recently passed away. But the months leading up to his sudden death, I had a heavy feeling. Me and mum would talk about going to see him. Work, etc. always got in the way. But I felt very strongly about needing to meet him as an adult, so we made the trip. Previously, We had tried to meet up with him, but things always got in the way, like his illness or just last minute cancellations. He opened the door and straight away, 
pulled me into a hug, saying this is the one I've been waiting for. We spent the next few hours laughing and talking about his life and our joint interest in the paranormal. He told me many of his own stories and encounters, including the significance of white feathers. As I left, he had light tears in his eyes and he said to me, you were exactly as I hoped you would be, and more. He wanted to show me an old picture he loved, but as he pulled it out from behind his dusty cabinet, a white feather floated down to the floor. We both laughed out of shock and amusement. A couple of months after that, he passed away due to sudden sepsis. So I was visiting my mum shortly after the death, and I was outside in the back garden having a smoke on my own. An overwhelming feeling came over me, like nostalgia. I felt happy but sad as Uncle P popped into my head. I went back inside and closed the door but froze. There it was, a white feather stuck on the door handle. Let me tell you now, it was not there before I walked out. Trust me, I would have noticed. You couldn't miss it. And my mum would never have stuck it there. I used to dance. We practiced in a studio on the top floor of an old theater. I was about 12 years old and it was me and my best friend at the time that would go every Saturday together. We arrived late one Saturday. Usually at the bottom of the stairs, you pay. There was nobody there. We thought we must have been really late. So we ran up the two flights to the doors at the top that enters into the cloakroom. But as we got there, we just saw darkness through the small round windows. I peered in, seeing nothing but black and looked back to my friend, who shrugged, but suddenly her eyes widened as she gazed beyond my so shoulder. I followed her gaze back to the window where I locked my eyes onto a man. He had red hair and his eyes were wide and piercing green. He was somewhat see-through, like what I'd imagine a mirage in my mind. I felt like I couldn't look away, but my logical brain took over and searched for a poster or something that he may have been reflecting from, but there was nothing. I looked back and he blinked. I heard the rush of frantic footsteps darting down the steps as I realized I had been left alone and my friend had escaped. I took one last look at the man who at this point, I swear, had grown a smirk in the corner of his mouth. And that done it, I followed suit. My heart was trying to break out of my chest as I sped after my friend. We didn't stop running until we were outside in the light and warmth. I said to her, what? What did you see? And she said, a man, I think. You see, it was different to looking through a window and seeing an actual person. This guy was faded. It was like a projection. We rang our parents from a payphone and asked them to come get us ASAP. We later found that the dance training was cancelled that week, but we both didn't get the memo. We lost contact after a few years, but would still follow each other on social media. One night, my curiosity got the better of me, and I messaged her asking if she remembered what happened that day, or if it was just a cause of my childhood imagination. She confirmed that she still had the image of the red-haired man burned into her memory. Every time I think about him, I feel a chill. I actually wish I would have stayed longer, but I shudder what would have happened if I had opened that door. Since I was 11, I used to hang out with my little sister N and my childhood best friend M in this abandoned manor. Our parents didn't want us to go there because it's said that the place is used for satanic rituals. I didn't believe in the existence of Satan and things like that, so we kept going to the manor. At 12, I started to feel depressed. Long story short, I was severely bullied and my parents were in continuous fights. I hated being home and I started to go to the manor alone or just with Vicky, my female Doberman. That place started feeling like home and I started to study there, to draw or simply relax while the dog explored the little wood that still surrounds the manor and the castle nearby. Before believing in the paranormal, in that manner I experienced things. These two are the more interesting. In the manor's hall there's a chair. Sometimes we sat down at the main entrance. 
with the chair on the other side of the wall. And a moment later, it was near us. I never got scared. And knowing that we weren't the only kids going there, I thought that the chair was already near us and we were so used to seeing it on the other side of the room that we just didn't acknowledge it sooner. Nothing paranormal, right? Even when we clearly saw the chair in one place and a moment later it was near us, I kept believing in the it was already there, we didn't see it thing. I often heard a woman crying. Being a skeptic, I used to think I was imagining it, but a few times N and M heard it too. I always left the place with them because I was the older. I thought it was some human stranger and I wanted N and M to be safe. Even alone, I heard the cry and my dog always tried to go towards the chair, waggling his tiny tail and basically doing the same she used to do when I cried. I kept believing in the presence of a homeless or just weird woman and went home for safety. After a while, I just ignored the cry and stayed in the manor. I started to believe it when I was 13 or 14 years old. I was at the manor with Vicky and I had three knocks on the third floor. The place was surrounded by trees so I thought about some animal dropping or something. There were a lot of squirrels and it was a possible explanation. After a few minutes, three knocks on the second floor, nearer. It kept going like this and the knocks were coming towards me. My dog started growling aggressively. I know I should have run away. But I was curious and stayed there until the knocks were coming by my side. Only then I ran away after doing my research and learning that three knocks mean that a demon is being disrespectful towards the Holy Trinity. Well, even as an atheist, I didn't go to the manor for almost a year. After that day, I started to notice more things. Weird noises, objects moving. 90% of the time, I explained it logically but I was unable to rationalize the things that started to happen when I was 15 and I just restarted to go to the manor. Always with someone and never inside the manor now. Me, M and N started to see something weird in my garden. It was like a black human silhouette. My father saw it too. I stopped my visits to the manor once again when I saw that figure in my home. Sulfur smells in the bedroom. Something knocked inside my sister's side of our wardrobe, giving her nightmares. We share a room to this day, and she said the noise has stopped when I was away from home. Now something knocks over my clothes and knocks inside my side of the wardrobe. We have 13 cats, but every time I hear something, I never find a cat inside the wardrobe. Me and other people saw a young woman crying at the window of the manor, before vanishing into thin air. Something chased me, the first and only time I visited the manor alone, at 18 years old. I once created a story on that manor. I always felt a female presence, I call her Elise, near the chair and a male presence, I call him Lord, in one room. So I wrote a story about a young woman who was married to a traveller. They loved each other so much that she killed herself when he was murdered while travelling to Germany. My mother told me that it's what happened to a couple that lived in the manor decades ago. I'd never heard that story before. My friend Jay saw the crying woman while visiting the manor with friends. They begged me to come there because I know the place like the back of my hand and I found them scared as hell. I told them not to enter the Lord's room and one of them never listened. I'm able to enter the room without problems but strangers always feel bad or sick. This guy vomited and had a bad fever shortly after being in the room. I started feeling really affectionate toward the crying woman. I feel like crying whenever I think about her and my sister said to me this morning that she saw a woman sitting on my bed. I never told her that I feel someone sitting on my bed at night because I always thought I was imagining it. I don't know what to do people. I don't know what logical explanation I could give to those things and what to do in general. I feel like I should help Elise and my friend Jay. She's a sensitive and a green witch. And to me, and said to me that the tarot said that there's a ghost who needs company. Do you have some advice? Some logical explanation? Should I just believe? Some background information about my house. 
My house is over a hundred years old. As a kid, I was also so scared and afraid of the dark. I was scared easily. And usually when I'm home alone, I would leave on all lights and leave on the TV. So I don't feel so alone and scared. I'm not 100% sure if someone has died in the house, but whenever I was alone at night, I always had a feeling like I was being watched, like someone was staring at me. This event took place in middle school for me. I was up late because I was the type of kid that never does his homework when he gets home, always waits till last minute. And that's usually past my bedtime, which is 10 p.m. But this time I had an essay due in the morning. So I was up working on my essay that I needed to hand in the next day. My mom recently just went to bed and the rest of my family has been in bed since 10 p.m. It was only me on the dining table working on the essay just a little past midnight. It could be closer to 1 a.m. but I'm not 100% sure. As I'm working on my essay, I start to hear a little rattling noise coming from the backyard door. It seemed like it was the doorknob. Someone or something was playing with the doorknob and making it rattle. I was very scared. But this essay was more important and I had to get it done. So I just continued to write my essay. As the sound starts to crescendo slowly and get ever so louder, I start to panic a little bit and go check it out. Not fully check it out, but just enough to see the door and see what is making that sound. A little layout of my house so you can understand how I was positioned. From the dining room table where I was sitting, to the kitchen sink was about eight feet. The kitchen was almost like a small hallway with an island counter and shelves on one side. And on the other side was the sink, fridge, stove, and the little kitchen counter. Down the end of the hallway is where my backyard door was. I just peeped my head just opposite the kitchen sink at the end of the island counter where I can have a good view of the back door. And from what I could see, the doorknob was not moving at all from what I could see, but possible the outside doorknob was because I knew the sound of the doorknob moving. Someone or something was shaking or rattling the doorknob from the outside. I left it alone, still scared at this point and went back to working on my essay. The rattling and shaking of the doorknob is not stopping and slowly getting a little louder as I continue to work. It's been about five minutes since I started hearing the doorknob shaking and I'm really scared at this point. So I decided to go to bed and wake up early tomorrow to work on my essay. So I turned off the lights and went straight to bed. A mere five minutes has probably passed since I turned off the lights and went to bed. As I'm laying in bed thinking about what just happened and what I need to write next in the essay, I realized I didn't hear the doorknob rattling anymore. It suddenly stopped. So I decided to get back up because I had to finish this essay and I'm still wide awake. So I turn on the light and continue to work on my essay. Not even a minute had passed since I turned on the light and the doorknob was shaking very intensely and violently all of a sudden. The loudest I've ever heard it this night and I was even more scared and turned off the lights and went straight to bed. I live in the UK and come from a town that was first settled by Romans for context. It's a very historical area. When I was a child, I lived in a house built in the early 1800s. The whole street was built to house the fishermen of the time. Before that, I understood it was farmland. It was from four years of age, I would start getting these dreams of someone in a wheelchair, deformed and tormenting me. It was a nightly occurrence and made me cry and shriek for my brother. It soon ended after a couple of years. However, this is when I started to see things whilst I was awake. And one of them really did make me freeze every time without fail. It started when I was lying in my bottom bunk bed and I would turn over and look and see on the other side of the room, two cat's heads fighting to get past each other near the bookshelf. This happened often and I just shrugged it off eventually. But one night, I'll never forget the first time. I saw a lady lying on my bedroom floor, right near that same bookshelf. Absolutely motionless, no movements, nothing. I was too scared to move the first few times I encountered her. 
I eventually plucked the courage to stand up and properly look. She looked weathered, wearing a drab and beaten looking dress robe and hair wild and untamed. I could make out much the face, but it just looked empty. I would turn on the lights and she would be gone. The moment I turned it back off, I would see her there again, lying in front of the bookshelf. The most frightening night was when I awoke to see her lying there, in the usual spot, accompanied by some unnatural noises and a fatigued breathing sound I will never forget. It was as if she was trying to breathe with liquid iron in her lungs. I never screamed so hard and cried at the same time in my life. My mother said I was being ridiculous the entire time, but my brother saw the sincerity in my eyes. So fast forward when I'm older and we're moving house. My mum got a local surveyor in to get the property done. Anyway, he came up to my room whilst I was boxing up and we started chatting. I then joked about how I would see that lady and sometimes the cat near the bookshelves. He then jokes, oh, you do realise there's a fireplace built in the wall where your bookcase is, right? I said, okay, and? He looked at me a bit dumbfounded for a bit and changed the subject. I then asked why he mentioned the fireplace and he stopped. He told me not to be alarmed and not to take it to heart and even said he doesn't believe in ghosts or anything but continued that in the late 1800s, someone in one of the houses on the street had locked up a relative. I'm very vague on this part because I can't quite remember the conversation due to the sheer fright and fear going through me at the time in their room and left them to starve after they went mad. Allegedly, the woman lit the fire and died from smoke inhalation. Apparently, someone in a wheelchair had died in the house prior to us moving in as well. I have no clue if any of that was true. I could only find a few references in local papers from archives about or obituaries in the area, but nothing about causes of death, etc. But it's just always been in my head. So I was driving up north with my mom to visit my grandparents. It's a two day trip, so we had stopped in a motel. Nothing was out of the ordinary, and the motel was pretty nice for such a remote area. I went to sleep and dreamed I was at my grandparents' house, and that it was haunted. Before this, I had recurring dreams where one specific room of their house was haunted, but I had never dreamt of any entity in particular. I just saw things move on their own, had the blankets ripped off of me, and heard unintelligible whispering until I woke up. This dream was different. It was the same room, and it started off just as terrifying as the others. But then I discovered that the entity was a teenage boy who had been murdered. I'm a teenage girl, and we sat in the room and spoke just like any two teenagers would. At one point in the dream, I went down to get a drink. And when I came back in the room, the door slammed behind me. I jumped and screamed a little, but he was standing in front of the door laughing, and I told him to cut it out. It was just so normal, like I was talking to a friend from school or something. But I'd never seen this kid before in my life. By the end of the dream, we were quite familiar with each other, and he confided how lonely I was since he had died to me. How he missed his friends and worried about them and how he couldn't tell them what happened to him or what death was like. I did my best to comfort him and he asked if he could show me where he died. I said, okay. And he touched my head and I saw him lying in a pile of trash or recycling, blood on his face and blood accumulating around his head, his clothes dirty and his eyes blank. It only lasted a couple of seconds and when I came to, I just looked at him and didn't say anything. I took his hand in mine and we just sat there on the bed looking at ourselves in the old vanity mirror. Then I woke up. I have a lot of weird and vivid dreams, so I wasn't on edge when I woke up. I didn't even mention it to my mom. We got back on the road and I started playing video games again. Then we pulled into a rest stop in the middle of the forest. At this point, we were pretty far from the town we'd slept in and the next town was where my grandparents lived. The only other people who lived around there lived on Indian reserves and you couldn't hide a person there. They're way too small. 
I get out of the car to stretch my legs, and while I'm walking to the bathroom, I see a couple of missing posters taped to the trash bin. And there he is. Roughly the same age, same hair, same clothes, same fucking name. When we got back into the car, I told my mom and she believed me, yet wasn't surprised in the slightest. She had always believed strongly in the paranormal and had told me lots of stories from her life. Once her house had been robbed when she was a young girl, and as soon as she walked in, she went upstairs straight to where the robber had left his watch. My mom also does this thing where every month or so, she'll stop whatever we're doing, cover her eyes with her hands, and tell me she's dreamt the moments we're in now. She told me in the car that every woman in her family has had strange things like this happen to them, and it usually comes about in teenagerhood. I'm 16. I don't know if I really believe her. I mean, I believe what's happened to her and my grandma and all my aunts, but I don't know. I didn't think it could actually happen to me. I've recently asked her about a dream I had when I was around three or four, and she told me it wasn't a dream, that it actually happened. And then I asked my sister separately, and she told me the same thing. I was sitting on my sister's bed, and she was holding a stack of Go Fish cards face down. And I was guessing what they were, and every time I got it right, before she flipped them over. My mom was sitting in a chair watching us. She was very calm, and that's why I thought it was a dream. Also, you know, that shit's impossible. But considering what my mom said, it makes sense she wouldn't be surprised. My parents bought this house in the late 80s, with one previous owner who bought it when it was new. I do not know of any deaths, murders or issues with the property. It's a 1,000 square foot home with a basement that is the size of the entire house. When you walk in the front door, you're in the living room and can see directly into the kitchen. To the right at the entrance of the kitchen, there's a hallway that has all three bedrooms and one small bathroom at the end. If you walk through the kitchen, on the very back left side, there's a basement door. These details will help when trying to picture these stories. Story 1. When I was around 8 years old, our neighbour's daughter would watch us on occasion. We'll call her Kelly. She was 16 or 17 at the time. I have a younger brother who's 3 years younger than me. We were all in the living room playing hide and seek when we heard this ringing coming from the basement. The ringing sounded like a phone. It was like one of those old phones that would make a ton of noise and had a rotary dial. I asked my mom and she said later that we did not own one and there definitely wasn't a phone in the basement. So we hear this ringing and Kelly decides to go check and see what it is. She goes back and opens the basement door and it stops completely. She brushes it off and comes back. About 30 minutes later, we hear the ringing again. We listened to her for five minutes or so to make sure we weren't nuts. She went to the basement door, again, bless her, and it stopped as soon as she opened the door. She started to panic a little, but tried to play it off to not scare us. It started ringing again after like 20 minutes and lasted for about 10, because she didn't go back to the door to see what it was. Story 2 I was in my bedroom playing games late at night when I was about 14. I was the kid that stayed up all night during the summer and slept all day. It was probably 4am or so. I decided I was thirsty and went into the kitchen for some water. It was pitch black because I didn't want to wake my family. Our bedrooms are all grouped together. I go down the hallway and make it right into the kitchen. And all of a sudden I smell this strong baby powder smell. It was like someone had dumped it on me. I paused for a second to be sure I wasn't imagining it. I then took a step back and could not smell it at all. I then took the step forward again and the smell hit me so hard it scared me to death. I ran as fast as I could back to my room. The next morning I asked my mom if anyone she ever knew smelled like baby powder and she said my great grandmother always smelled like it. Her words like she had poured it on herself every morning. Really freaky. Story 3. This was the most intense of all experiences I've ever had. 
I was a little older, 17 or so at the time. I was alone at home. Background info. We had an air hockey table that had a broken on-off switch. So in order to use it, you had to plug it in manually every time. My mom was very particular about the air hockey table looking neat when we were done. So we put all the pucks on the ends neatly. There's a vent in the bathroom that leads directly to the basement, so you can hear everything. Anyways, I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth when I hear the clack 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 of the pucks hitting the side of the table and the air running on it. It was pretty loud when on. I was like, what? And went to the basement door to look down. You could see directly to the table from the top of the steps. It was on, plugged in, and the pucks were all over the place. I called out to my brother who didn't answer because I was alone, thinking maybe he came home early. No response. I thought maybe he left it on and went downstairs to fix it. I unplugged it, wrapped the cord around my leg and placed the pucks back because my mum would have been upset. I go back upstairs and mind my business for like an hour when I have to use the restroom. I go in there, sit and hear the table going through the vent again. I could hear clearly that the pucks were moving. I'll never forget that. Now I'm pretty freaked. I slink back to the basement door and open it. Flip the light on. The table is plugged in and running. And everything is out of place again. Bro. I go down again. I am stupid. What is wrong with me? And fix it all. I come back up. Go to my room for like 10 minutes. Go to the bathroom to see if I could hear it. And it's going again. I didn't go back down there until the next day. I got in trouble for leaving it on all night. I had something like that happen once. I was working in a restaurant that specializes in noodles and was on my lunch break. We had just finished lunch rush and had gotten everything ready for dinner. It was around 2.30 p.m and I was sitting at the bar facing the front, eating lunch, and the cook came over and sat with me. About 10 minutes later, as both of us were sitting there, my boss came running from the back of the restaurant, out to where we were eating. She went through the dining room and then came over to the cook and I. She asked where the customer was. We both looked at each other and then said, no one has been in for 20 minutes. She then says to us, I was working at the desk and looked out the window but I noticed a customer standing in front of the register. I figured she took care of them, but looked back five minutes later and the customer was still standing there. That's when I came out to look for the customer and then reamed you two out. The customer is gone. We once again told her no one has been in for 20 minutes. We would also get customers reporting they saw a small child out of the corner of their eye, run into the ladies restroom unsupervised. The customer would then get up and go look for the kid, and the kid was never there. This happened at least twice a week at all different times. The street in front of the restaurant was getting repaved at night, so there was a construction crew outside from 10pm to 6am. After about a week of construction, a crew member came into the restaurant to ask what our hours are. I told him 11am to 9pm, Sunday through Thursday and 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday nights. He said, that's what I thought, but you have people in your restaurants at 2 a.m. I said we should not, and he was sure he noticed them twice last week. I asked the gentleman if he could wait for five minutes as I went to the back to check the security tape. Lo and behold, no one on the tape at 2 a.m. I showed the gentleman the tape. After he watched it, he did the sign of the cross and ran out the restaurant. I'm sensitive to spirits and can often see them. It scares me when they're around, even though much of the time they're just hanging out. I've had some experiences that have gone further than that. We own a house that was built in 1865 that was a church parsonage. We have two spirits that live here. A young woman with long dark hair and a white gown that we often forget is here. I actually haven't seen her for years, though my daughter has seen her often. The other spirit is not a nice one. He lives in my computer room. He won't allow anyone to sleep in that room. 
On occasions I've tried. He'll either nudge me awake every half hour or he'll induce nightmares. And one time he appeared to me with a very angry twisted face and screamed, get out. There was one night that frightened me so bad. I haven't even tried to nap in that room since. I was sleeping and the spirits grabbed what I can only assume was my soul and shoved me into the corner of the room. He started applying pressure to every part of my body. I was struggling to breathe or speak. Every time I tried to say something, he'd apply more pressure. It was really starting to hurt. As I struggled against him, he applied more pressure and I pictured my mother. I wanted to call out to her no matter how much effort it took. I opened my mouth and I managed to speak out, Grand... Oh. That wasn't what I wanted to say, but it's what came out. And the moment I said the last syllable, I was wide awake on the bed, gasping for breath, my lungs and body hurting. I left the room and didn't go back in there. I believe my grandmother, who died eight years ago, saved me. I know some may say I was sleeping, having a nightmare, sleep paralysis or whatever, but I know otherwise because of other experiences I've had with this spirit. I've seen him several times when I'm wide awake and just working on my computer. Even my children have seen him. That isn't what this thread is about though. I used to think all pets, especially cats, could see spirits. This past weekend, I learned only one of my five cats can see them. His name is Marley. I work the night shift and he's often in the living room with me. Sometimes he'll stop whatever he's doing to stare intently at something. Sometimes it's a bug and I can tell because his eyes will dart all over the place. But when he stares at one spot without moving, I know it's a spirit. I typically don't worry about it too much and I don't open up my awareness to them because I don't want to know they're really there. But this past weekend was one that freaked me out because my cat was scared. He was doing that staring thing but his tail was puffed up four times its normal size. I thought he was looking at a moving paper or something in my husband's computer room. So I closed the door, but my cat didn't stop. And he was still staring at the same spot in front of my husband's computer room. I shared videos of it with a friend who told me to pick him up and bring him to where he was looking. When I tried that, my cat hissed and clawed me to get down. I was very out of character for him. He continued to stare in that one spot. Then whatever he was looking at must have moved down the hall. I wanted to know what was there, so I shielded myself and reached out with my awareness. And I saw a tall, pale man in a black trench coat standing in front of the entrance to our home at the end of the hall, unmoving and just watching me. Half of me think it's my imagination, but the other half knows better. My friend told me I should ask him to leave. I just wanted to leave it alone and let it be on its way in its own time. But my cat was becoming increasingly agitated, tail puffed up, and now the fur on his back was standing up. He kept staring at it. I decided, fine, I'll ask it to leave. Feeling silly because I didn't really believe there was a spirit there. So I made a big show of telling it that it doesn't belong here. This is my home and he needs to leave. I was walking down the hall as I said that, practically laughing at myself for being so silly. And when I got to the final part about him needing to leave, I reached the spot where I saw he was standing and pointed out the door. It felt like I walked into a cold cloud. I heard a buzzing noise in my ears, pressure on my head, and static electricity that caused the hair all along my neck and back to stand up. Very freaky feeling. Then I saw this spirit turn into a black cloud and go out the door. Almost immediately, my cat calmed down. He glanced at that spot a couple of times at first, but he was more interested in being pet, playing with a box, or just lying down for a nap. I knew the spirit was gone. I had at least two other cats and my chihuahua in the room, and none of them reacted to the spirit or gave any indication of seeing it. So much for taking comfort in my pets alerting me when something is around. When I shared this story with my mom and husband the next day, my 16 year old daughter got really excited and said, you finally saw him? I've been seeing him off and on since I was nine. That's when I recalled my daughter wanting to sleep with a light on or wanting to sleep with us because she was seeing this spirit standing in her room, watching her sleep. I 
had a very strange dream one night when I was living in Colorado. In the dream, I was sitting on my bed back home in Guam. I was humming and reading a book to myself, something I do almost every day. After a few minutes, I decided that I wanted to go to my parents' room. I got off the bed and walked across the end of the hallway with heavy footsteps to my parents' bedroom door. As usual, the door was closed. I wrapped my right hand around the doorknob and tried to turn it. It was locked. For some reason, I really wanted to enter their room. I turned the doorknob back and forth, but it wouldn't budge. My stubborn dream self was not accepting that the door was locked. I placed my left hand over my right hand and shook the door with all my strength. It still didn't open. I gave up after a few seconds, released my tight grip from the doorknob and clumsily walked down the hallway towards the kitchen. I don't remember ever reaching the kitchen before waking up. I looked at my alarm clock. It was five o'clock in the morning. I went back to sleep. I was on the phone with my parents the following evening, Colorado time when they told me about a strange experience they had the night before, Guam time. They were watching TV. The aircon was on in their bedroom, so they made sure to close the door. My mom quickly moved to the TV as she heard a strange noise coming from my bedroom. My parents are empty nesters, so there should not be anyone in the house but them. Then they heard heavy footsteps walk out of my bedroom, across the hallway and towards their door. The doorknob began to slowly turn on its own. There was a brief pause before it turned again a few more times. All of a sudden, the door began to shake violently. The shaking ceased after several seconds. The heavy footsteps moved from the other side of their door, down the hall, and towards the kitchen. When did this happen? I asked, as my heart began to race and my breath became shallow. This was around 10 last night, my mom replied. 10 p.m. in Guam? It would have been 5 a.m. in Colorado. For a span of 18 months, from March 2012 to September 2013, I would experience a disturbing recurring dream almost every night. I would either have this dream or no memorable dream at all. The brief events and surrounding details of the dream were always exactly the same without any variation. Seven years later, I can still recall this dream as if I've just awoken from it. In the dream, I'm sitting in the driver's seat of a vehicle, looking through the eyes of a tall driver. I know I'm not the driver because I look down and to the right and see myself sitting in the front passenger seat. We're talking and laughing. The conversation and laughter in the dream are muffled and distant, like voices underwater. Through the eyes of the driver, I look past myself in the passenger seat, through the front passenger window, and see a mass approaching at high velocity. The colour and shape of the mass are indeterminate, shifting and flowing through a spectrum of light and space that my mind cannot comprehend. The mass is quickly becoming larger and larger. Suddenly and violently, the mass collides with the front passenger side of the vehicle. This immense kinetic energy surges through my body, as if the convulsions of a massive earthquake have been condensed into a single moment, encasing me and penetrating me. Glass implodes from multiple directions like a bomb. The barrier constructed from protection transforms into a sea of shrapnel, sending thousands of tiny sharp teeth to bite and tear and rip and stab at every inch of my skin. The metal frame of the vehicle begins to collapse and rotate, as if it's nothing more than paper to be crumbled and tossed away. The space around me is becoming smaller and whirling faster, like the motion of an endless roller coaster. My eyes never close and I never look away from the passenger seat. I see myself lurch forward as, it, as if I weigh less than air. My face collides with the dashboard, the airbag never deploys. I woke up. For 18 months, I've had this dream. For 18 months, I become more stressed and more anxious. I see the dream when I sleep. I see the dream when I'm awake. I couldn't be in the front passenger seat of any vehicle without feeling my blood pressure rise. It gets to the point where I'm even scared to fall asleep for fear of seeing the event of the dream. In September 2013, I had the dream for the last time. One day passes, one week passes, 
one month passes, I still do not have the dream. I don't even question this because I'm so happy to be able to sleep again and not feel fear any time I'm in a vehicle. I feel that long, strange and terrible period is finally past me. Two months later, on a beautiful day in November 2013, I was working at the visitor center of the National Wildlife Refuge where I had been employed for a little over two years. It's a slow day at work and not many people are coming into the building. The tropical beach is far more interesting than our display murals and informational plaques. I take advantage of this slowness and spend my time reading. Mid-morning arrives and I hear the chime of the front door ring as soft footsteps enter the visitor centre. I look up from my book and see a young couple who seem to be in their early to mid-thirties. I greet them, but they don't notice me in the distance. I return my gaze to my book as their attention is drawn to our murals and plaques. Some time passes before I hear a soft, feminine voice politely say, Excuse me, from the opposite side of the court, counter. Yes, I respond as I look up and smile to meet the eyes of the young woman. But as soon as I face her, her expression very quickly changes from inquiry to shock. She immediately turns to walk away. Without saying another word, she walks from the counter to the wall about five meters away. Her husband, presumably sensing her discomfort, walks up to her and puts his arm around her shoulders. They're talking in whispers that I cannot hear. She's visibly upset about something. I think this is very strange at first, but ultimately it's none of my business. I look away from them so that they don't feel judged or observed. Many minutes pass and the woman returns to the counter. Her face is a bit puffy and her eyes are a little red. She takes a quick, deep breath and proceeds to ask me about the free cave tours available to visitors of the refuge. Without hesitation, I begin to describe the tour. About two minutes pass and she breaks down into full tears. She's crying heavily as her husband rushes back to her side. I'm so sorry, was there something I said? Of all I can think to say this moment. She wipes her face with the tissues I hand her before taking a breath and speaking again. She apologizes. I reassure her that there's nothing to apologize for. What she shares with me is something that will stick with me for the rest of my life. She attended university in Australia and lived there for 10 years. In her decade there, her best friend, a woman who became her sister, looked and spoke exactly like me. She was my complete doppelganger. Two months earlier, in September 2013, her best friend was involved in a major car accident. Another driver had hit her friend's side of the vehicle. The airbag never deployed and she died instantly. My heart begins to race and every ounce of air seems to empty from my lungs. After some time and comforting from her husband, the woman asks if they can go on the cave tour. Of course, I responded. We go on our tour and return to the visitor center over an hour later. The woman tells me of their plans for the rest of their trip. After a brief silence, she reaches out and gives me a deep hug. Goodbye, 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 she keeps, repeating slowly in a soft, forlorn whisper, as she holds me in a warm embrace. I'm not the hugging type of person, but I realize that it's not me she's reaching out for. I let her stay there for as long as needed, returning her hug. After a while, she lets go. She doesn't look at my face as she turns and walks away. The woman and her husband take each other's hand and walk out the door. I never saw them again. Growing up, I was the only girl in a pack of neighborhood boys. My family lived on the East Coast, so there were plenty of trees for the boys and I to play in. We made forts, played hide and seek, and had miles upon miles of woods to explore. My parents got me a puppy when I was seven, and by the time I was nine, the family dog was 65 pounds, and enough of a deterrent that strangers wouldn't approach me. My parents made sure Taz was ridiculously well trained. He healed, had an excellent recall, barked, and stopped barking on command, and had a very terrifying growl that scared people from getting too close. He'd stay with me off leash, only bolting if I gave him permission to chase a deer squirrel, 
or occasionally have him chase one of my friends. I had to take Taz with me every time I went out. There was a grove of trees behind one of my best friend's houses that was very long and maybe a quarter mile thick. Houses surrounded it on every side, but you could get so deep into it that you couldn't see any houses. We played there often, as it was close enough to home that we could scamper back before dark and not get into any trouble. On this particular day, we decided to play hide and seek. The boys made Taz and me seek first, and we found them ridiculously fast. After we were done, I decided that we should hide in a special place. A few weeks before, one of the older boy packs had told us never to go into one spot of bushes and tall grass. We asked why, but they muttered about poison ivy and snakes, and we didn't think to ask further. I had an immunity to poison ivy, and I knew Taz would warn me if there were any snakes nearby, so we went for it. The forbidden spot would be the best hiding place, because nobody would think to go there. The forbidden spot was pretty much a 50 foot circle of space. There was a sidewalk to my left and the forest to my right, so I made sure to hide Taz and myself well enough that nobody could see us from either side. I put Taz down, stayed and waited for my friend to admit he couldn't find us, in the best of hiding spots. Two minutes in, Taz starts growling. Thinking he sees a stranger, I peek towards the sidewalk and quietly order him to hush. Nobody's on the sidewalk. I start to look right, thinking someone might be sneaking up beside us. Nope. Right in front of us, on the other side of the bush, is another girl and another dog. I peek through the branches and see that she looks like every girl from every horror movie. Long black hair but with bangs so I can see her glowing red eyes. I can't focus on her face because of those eyes. They're somehow slightly misty or fuzzy, making it hard for me to see her pupil. I barely even notice her off-white dress. Her dog is gigantic, at least the size of a wolf. It's long and skinny with the same glowing red eyes as her. The dog looked like a very buff, bald Labrador. In the few seconds where I stared, the girl took another step forward. Taz was done hushing. He growled as loudly as he could and tried to dart at her. I grabbed Taz's collar not wanting him to fight with a gigantic dog that could have ripped him to pieces. Neither the girl nor her dog seemed frightened by Taz. They turned around and walked nonchalantly back towards the sidewalk. Taz ripped free of his slip-on collar and chased after them, breaking free of the tree line. I followed Taz and looked all around, but nobody was there. It had only been a second since they'd left. We were in a neighborhood, so the way they went only led to sidewalks, townhouses, and manicured grass. Taz had stopped growling and had his nose to the ground, running in a wide circle to try to pick up their scent again. Taz couldn't seem to find anything because he returned to my side. I looked everywhere, but couldn't see the red-eyed girl or her dog. We went back into the trees and ran promptly into one of the boys. Found you first. Back in 2011, our family moved from my childhood village to a nearby town called Buckerberg. We moved into a half-timbered house from the 16th century, which was a listed building. My mother had just taken over a restaurant and was always very stressed at this point. I was 12 years old and had to grow up very early because my mother had to be able to rely on me or she had to take care of her restaurants. Mine and my sister's rooms were outside my parents' apartment and had real front doors, so to speak. As it was such an old building, the floor consisted almost entirely of wooden floorboards, which in isolated places creaked quite thickly when you stepped on them. One of these places was right at the entrance to my room, maybe two or three steps away from the door, which was also one of the loudest places you could step on. But these spots only creaked when there was weight on it, so it wasn't enough if I threw a shirt there or something. After living there for about half a year, I woke up for the first time through the creaking of the floorboards in the middle of the night, which I couldn't really understand at this point since I only woke up. Since I couldn't find an explanation, I dismissed it as a normal sound made by the wood 
and went back to sleep with a queasy feeling. For weeks, nothing happened until I woke up again to this squeaking. This time, not as sleepy as the last time, I quickly realised that this was not normal. So violent and loud, as if someone was standing on the squeaky spot and his weight was lost. I thought I was going completely crazy and could no longer trust my perception. After the floorboards did not stop creaking after more than a minute, I couldn't take it anymore and ran over to my mother's bedroom and told her crying what was going on. My mother still believes that I dreamed it. And so the squeak happened every now and then, and over time, I gradually lost the fear of it. It was about eight or nine months since the first incident, when some new things were gradually added, such as doors that opened and closed by themselves, one of our taps that suddenly ran in the middle of the night, and our cats that just started in the air, hissing and growling. Over the time we lived there, my entire gut feeling became increasingly uncomfortable. More and more often, I had the feeling that I wasn't alone. It almost felt as if I had someone sitting on my shoulder who was with me, no matter where and whenever. It was almost overwhelming. And then there was that one night after which I couldn't sleep in my room for three weeks or so. I was in my bed just before falling asleep in the evening, when that stupid squeaking of the floorboards started again. In the meantime, more annoyed than fearful, I pressed my pillow onto my ears in the hope that it would stop, as always. But this time it was different. It didn't stop after two or three minutes as usual, but went on for over 15 minutes and slowly got louder and more intense until I looked at some point. What I saw almost gave me a heart attack. I could literally feel a shockwave go through my whole body together with goosebumps. I was so scared that I almost vomited. I saw someone standing at the foot of my bed about five feet away and just staring at me. Because of the shock, I was frozen and stared back for what felt like five seconds. In these fractional moments, I could see what was there. It looked like an old woman in a long shirt and curly hair. This, this expression on her face, it looked disappointed and almost a little angry. But as I saw and realised all these facts, she was gone again. I slept on our couch for the next few weeks. My mother didn't want to believe all of this. It seemed to me as if I was the only one who noticed all these strange things. I think it was anywhere from a month to three months after the night I saw the old woman. At that point, I just turned 14. I came home from the cinema where I watched the second part of the Hobbit series with buddies. Later that evening, I was lying in my bed thinking about the film and what happened in it. When from one second to the other, the floorboards began to creak again. That was the first time after the incident with the old woman that it squealed again and a fear rose up in me I've never felt before. I had hoped so much that the noises would just stop right away, but I thought wrong. It was like the last time, only this time I didn't dare look at what made me lie there for about half an hour. When I was lying there and the noises didn't stop, a feeling came up in me that told me it won't stop until you look. I just wanted it to stop, so after a while, I gave into that feeling and looked. As shocked as the first time, I see another person standing there, but this time, a little different from the old woman. It's a man in his mid-thirties with old clothes, a helmet with a broken lamp and a dirty face. Like the old woman, he just stands there and stares at me for a few seconds with the same look as the woman before he disappears. Fortunately for me, we moved out a few weeks later anyway, which is how all these things ended. Since then, nothing has ever happened to me. I myself never believed in such a thing, and even made fun of people who said something like that. I don't tell anyone about it, because nobody believes me and everyone thinks I'm crazy if I do it. To this day, I can't categorise it properly, and I'm sure that I have a kind of a little trauma from it. But I'm also very sure of one thing. And that is, that there are ghosts. So when I was a kid, probably like 9 or 10, my aunt moved into a small trailer that my grandma's cousin and her husband owned. They had a good bit of land and were avid hunters, 
So they put this trailer on their land for their hunter friends to stay in whenever they'd visit. The only people that ever stayed there were random hunters and my aunt. One night, me, my mom and my siblings stayed the night with my aunt. I remember the night pretty clearly. My aunt decided to rent the movie Shallow Hell, and I was stoked to watch it. I'm enjoying the evening with my family, and about halfway through the movie, I get this eerie feeling like someone's watching me. I look to my left and out the window to see the face and upper body of a tall, lanky, semi-transparent old man staring in at me. Dude did not look happy at all. I instantly felt my blood run cold and my heart beat the fastest or hardest it's ever beaten in my entire life. I was so shocked, all I could do was look back at the TV as quickly as I could and try to pretend like nothing happened. I couldn't even find the courage to speak and tell everyone what I had just seen. Later that night, everyone's getting ready for bed and I'm definitely not looking forward to it. My younger siblings sleep in the next room, my mom and aunt in my aunt's room, and I sleep on the living room couch alone. My aunt had a dog that stayed outside and she barked all night long. Honestly, this was a little out of character for her because she was always a pretty chill dog, never really barking unless a car pulled up. Between the dog barking like crazy and the mini heart attack I had earlier from seeing some spooky old ghost man, I didn't think I'd ever get to sleep but eventually I passed out. This is the part that's always been mega weird to me. I woke up in the middle of the night, no longer on the couch, but laying on the floor. It's what felt like I was being electrocuted. I don't know. I felt what I imagined it would feel like to be tased. I couldn't move and wanted to scream, but nothing would come out. Absolutely terrifying. 100% thought I was going to die. It was the weirdest feeling ever. After a couple of minutes, I was able to get up and I ran straight to my aunt's room, crying like a baby. Of course, she said I was only having a nightmare and I ended up sleeping on the floor next to her bed for the rest of the night. In August of 2017, I was excited to buy a small house in Ontario. I had a good friend of mine move in to help with some bills throughout the rest of 2017. We only had a few cupboards in the kitchen open that we played off as something else, not really believing in the paranormal. Throughout the beginning of 2018 is when it really became active. It began slamming the kitchen cupboards, closing a door we never close, turning on the stove, leaving a claw mark on my thigh. And at one point, I was able to watch what I thought was my roommate walk from the kitchen to his bedroom, but he was still in the basement on his computer. In June of 2018, my roommate decided to move in with his girlfriend, so I thought it was time for mine to move in with me. She was obviously skeptical at first. In November, we found out we were having a baby. Over the nine months of pregnancy there, next to no activity, just cupboards left open again. August 2019, our baby is born. And the second we walk through the front door, we hear the baby room's door slam shut with incredible force. All through the first year of life, there was all kind of activity. We could hear voices through the sound machine, which shouldn't be possible. Constant slamming of things. Every picture we had hung had been taken off the wall. Lights flickering and the shower turning on. You name it. It got so bad that at one point we even considered bringing in a priest, even though we're not religious. Should I be scared for my baby's well-being? Should I try and expel the ghost somehow? I don't know how to start off this story, so I'll go straight to what happened. It was a regular Saturday night, I was at home with my older sister and my mom was waiting for my dad to come home from work. Keep in mind, my dad worked very late as a welder and it took him a little over an hour to go to and from work. However, it was past 9pm and my dad would usually come home by 7.30. So my mom sends me and my older sister to bed. We shared bunk beds during that time. So I turned on my Finding Nemo nightlight and headed to bed. I wake up randomly and look at my nightstand which had an old digital clock. 
and in dimly lit green numbers, I remember vividly seeing 1.52 a.m. Then, as I look up toward my open bedroom door, I see a man who's wearing a baseball cap, fully dressed, and about the height and build of my dad. My room was slightly dimmed because of my nightlight, but I wasn't able to see any more details than that. Also, I barely woke up, so my eyes were adjusting. I immediately assume it's my dad coming back from work and checking up on me and my sister, like he always did. So I say, Dad, why are you coming home so late? The shadow figure then walks into my parents' room, which is right next to our room. I found it odd that my dad didn't say anything to me. So I got up immediately and walked into their room. As I turn on their bedroom lights, my mom is in her nightgown and my dad is sleeping in his boxes. It was not even five seconds from the time the shadow figure walked into the room. I was expecting to see my father standing, changing into his sleeping clothes. But no, they were sound asleep. I woke up my parents, and my dad goes around and checks the house to see if it was an intruder. But the house door was locked, and we have gated windows so no one can break in. I slept in between them that night. To end this already long story... A couple of days ago, while visiting my parents and sleeping in my old room, I wake up to go pee. And as I head back to bed, I look at my phone. The time said 1.52am. I get this sudden feeling of dreadfulness. And as I'm standing looking at my phone near the bed, I look back and there he is again, standing by the open door. His shadow figure was just blurry showing. Because of the stove lights... My mom forgot to turn off. I immediately go under the covers like I was 11 again and just go to sleep. I told my parents about this story and they just say I'm spiritual. I've had a few other encounters I might write about later, but this was one of the two experiences that impacted me the most. For context, My family is very Catholic. Three generations, grandmother, mother, me, of catechists. My grandmother was a Eucharist minister and led several prayer groups before she got sick. My mom helps with the charity events in the parish. I was born into church life and was heavily involved as well. When I was a kid, about four years old, I used to have this swing set in my backyard. I was an only child with a very busy single mom at the time. I closed my eyes and wished for someone to push me high in the swings. I was told that Jesus was the best friend you could ask for. So I closed my eyes and asked him to play with me and to push on the swings. Next thing I know, I'm flying and the sky looks so blue and shiny almost. Definitely knew someone was there with me, pushing me higher and higher on the swing set. Didn't feel scared. I had a lot of fun. I didn't look back. I don't know why. I just knew he was there. At the time, I didn't realise that what happened was bizarre. Then found out people don't actually see Jesus, like walking around or playing with them. They just thought it was cute when I said I played with Jesus. I don't think they realised what I was referring to. Sometime after that, I had a horrible nightmare. I screamed and my mom had to pray over me to convince me I was safe and to go back to bed. I don't remember the dream. I do remember, however, telling my grandma, which she replied with, the devil comes in dreams to torment and scare us. I've had similar dreams too. Don't be afraid. They're more afraid of you. My mother just wrote it off as a typical nightmare, but those words that my grandmother told me got stuck in my little five-year-old brain. Fast forward 13 years, I'm getting ready for college, spending my last holy week home. I was preparing for a big move. I was nervous. I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. It was holy thirsty and we were in Eucharistic adoration till midnight. I was in deep prayer, asking for guidance. Lost track of time. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Big, strong, warm, I thought it may be my mom or somebody else showing me their support or joining me. I'm very touchy-feely with people, so it wouldn't surprise or bother me. When I finally opened my eyes, 
I look back and nobody has their hand on my shoulder, but I still feel it there. I look to where the person should be, look up and smile. There was no fear in me. I felt at total peace. At the same time, my soul felt it could float out my body. When I looked at my knees, they were already darkish blue and purple. It seemed I was kneeling for too long without noticing. It physically hurt to get up, and I felt happy but tired and drained from the experience. Next day, Holy Friday, we were back in the church in adoration. There's something we do called garden, which people are assigned to stand close to the Eucharist in comparison to the rest of the people. And you rotate. It's a big deal for us Catholics since, in our minds, it's literally being at the feet of Jesus. Anyway, I was put on guard duty. Your focus is supposed to be solely on him. You're not supposed to look back until you're tapped on the shoulder, which indicates you have to switch. I'm doing my guard and I feel these footsteps behind me. I know it's supposed to be my substitute. I'm turning slightly around since I know they're close by to reach me. However, standing there behind me is a blonde man in a white robe of sorts. Then God. It was a split second. That shocked me. I knew it wouldn't hurt me, but actually seeing him and then disappearing, and nobody else noticed. I couldn't shake it out of my system. Half of me thinks I just imagine it. Half knows I didn't. After the shock passed, I was euphoric. I could see angels, damn it. I was going to start healing the sick and levitating. All that cool shit. I got cocky. Thought I was spiritually super strong. Since I thought I had this superpower, I had to use it for good. So I tried to do an exorcism. Yeah, we all make mistakes. But this one was the worst of all. There wasn't anything even paranormal in the house. I just wanted to say the rights out loud so I could scare them demons and make them cower in fear. Oh boy. I started saying the rites, which by the way, it's said to be used by a priest only, and the lights started to flicker. All three of them. Then, all at once, they went out. An impending sense of doom gripped me. Something was in the room with me. I don't know if I screamed or not. I was paralysed by fear. Finally, I ran out of there and was able to breathe again. I didn't tell my mum what I did, since I was still in shock and didn't want to expose her. The less she knew, the better. It could kill me, but not her. I didn't sleep that night. I just prayed. I asked God to show me what the hell attacked and coincidentally, an article on Asmodeus popped up. Pretty convinced it was him. Next morning, I was going to use the bathroom to get ready for school. When I turned to go in, I saw this black figure just sitting on it. Solid black, spiky. No eyes, mouth, featureless. Big, extremely so. It looked solid, not like a shadow. I ran for my life downstairs. I wanted to scream, but it couldn't get the noise out. I didn't eat that day. I was too nauseous. The adrenaline kept pumping through me the whole day. I was in shock. Then, fast forward to the present day. My grandmother was attacked by a red and black being last Saturday. She was in the guest room, praying and preparing for bed, turning the lights off and this thing just showed up. All windows and doors were closed. Our houses are of cement, so we don't have too much problem with bats in our homes. And even if it was one, we don't have any that are black and red. It had wings and flew all around them, attacking them. Pretty big, although she wasn't too sure of the shape since it was so dark. My grandmother told us this. My heart sank and I've been pretty stressed and fearful this week. My mom thinks it was just a nightmare or some kind of medicine-induced hallucination. However, my grandmother told us she's been having these kinds of incidents a long time ago and spoken to priests about it. According to her, they told her that they target very prayerful, devout people in order to scare them off. She was over it quickly and then discussing where we could go shopping. She has balls of steel, but I'm so scared. I don't know if it's a thing that runs in the family or being more sensitive, but it's scary as hell.
Since this was September, I had always been purchasing Christmas gifts. The one I had for my dad was a pocket knife, specifically one designed with a bone handle grip and silver blade. Not very big, just enough of one for him to use as needed. He had carried a pocket knife at all times my entire life. I mention this because it's important in my story. He never saw this knife, by the way. A few weeks after he passed, I had a dream that my mom called and said, hey, your dad just got out of the hospital from having a minor heart attack and said they were going to our church to have some lunch. So I said I would meet them there with my wife and son to get some food. When I got there, I remember just sitting down and talking with my parents and enjoying our time. At which point my dad started messing with the hospital band he had on his wrist. I said, Dad, I'll get that off for you, so hang on. And as I reached to get my knife, he put his hand on mine and said, Hang on, son. Why don't you use this knife instead? And then he pulled out the pocket knife I had bought him for Christmas that year. He then put his hand on my shoulder and told me that he was okay and not to worry, that he felt better than ever. Then he began to glow very bright, just before I woke up. Could this have been a dream forced by my mind? Possibly, yes. But since then, I've had multiple instances of my home that could be the doing of my deceased father. This has just made me realise how true it is that our parents have much less time available to them than we may think. A couple of months ago, I was driving with my wife down a rural highway in Oregon, returning home from a road trip to Crater Lake. We live on the coast and the highway we were taking to get back is very curvy as it winds through Cascade mountain range. It was dark as ink and probably about 11 p.m. We were driving along and as I was watching the road, going about 45 miles an hour, we round a bend which makes me slow down to about 45. And just as we get around it, my wife suddenly says, look out, there's a person there. It takes me a second for some reason. As I let off the gas, then I notice her, him, it, crouched near the side of this two lane highway. On my left side is a person wearing what looks like grey baggy sweats or clothes and a reflective vest. This is an easy 20 miles either direction from civilization and is heavily wooded. Think Oregon Coast Forest. I begin braking and instantly the figure stands up, faces us and begins jogging directly at the car. It felt like electricity in the air as when she faced us, her head was flopped to the side, like her neck was totally limp and her mouth was wide open. She appeared to have grey hair and her arms and hands were held up to her chest, her wrists curled. Her legs didn't seem to be working right either as she hobbled at us, thinking like severely progressed MS. Then it hit this primal feeling of dread, like my subconscious knew something wasn't right. I couldn't fully focus on her as the car was still moving and I had to steer, but my wife was looking right at her. My first thought normally would have been to hit the brakes and see what was going on, as once again, this is literally miles and miles from town. But there was just this dreadful feeling in the air and time almost seemed to slow down. At that moment, I heard my wife say, don't stop, just go. Instinctively, I accelerated. As we sped up, this lady was jogging right at us and must have come within a foot of running into the side of our car as we went past her. We rounded the next bend and I looked at my wife and just said, what the hell was that? I should turn around. Who the hell jogs out here? What was wrong with her neck? My wife just looks at me and says, no, don't go back. I don't know what that was. I told her I couldn't look directly at her for long as I was focused on the road, but described what I saw and she confirmed she saw the same. She said when she came up to the side of the car, she was staring right at us and my wife looked her in the eyes, but she didn't have any pupils and her expression stayed just like frozen, mouth open. We scoured news stories and I even contacted authorities. They advised no one was reported missing or hurt out there. 
I still get the strange, intense, electri electrified feeling anytime I think about her, as does my wife. Anytime I talk about her, I'm compelled to refer to the person as it. All I know is it wasn't right. We have now coined her the floppy-headed jogger. Anyone else experienced something like this? So this actually happened not too long ago. My friend and I were walking back to my house at about three in the morning. We had just got done taking a walk to go smoke a doob. We both have our medical cards. When we walked past a bridge by the local powwow grounds, we were talking shit about the tribal chairman and we heard a whistle come from about 20 feet behind us. So for a little context, I live on a Native American reservation and us Native Americans are very superstitious. For example, if you jump out of a window, you have to jump back through for reasons I'm not even sure about. I was never really traditional. But another rule is that you're not supposed to whistle at night. I think it's like letting spirits know that you're being an idiot or something like that. I always like to piss off my other more traditional friends by whistling at night. And it just happens to be one of those nights. The whistle we heard was very loud and it sounded like one you need your fingers to do. I jumped when we heard it and I turned to look at my friend who looked like he was ready to cry. We both looked back at the pitch black, ready to get molested by some angry spirits. We looked for maybe 10 seconds before my friend just started bolting the other direction, leaving me behind. I'm not one to get scared easily, but damn was it terrifying being left alone in the dark. I finally caught up to him and we had made it to the nearby community college and we stopped under a streetlight. We both looked in the direction of the bridge, as if to taunt us, Whoever or whatever it was whistled at us again, this time a little quieter. I was completely mind blown more than scared because I've never experienced anything like this before. My friend on the other hand was keen on getting back to my house. So we jogged back to my house and continued to talk about it for the rest of the night while playing some games. About a month or so ago, I was staying with my partner Crow at his family home. He's not long moved into his old, bigger room, and generally, I get no bad vibes from it. One night, we happened to not get to sleep right away, which was uncommon, but not unsettling or for weird reasons. We just went to bed late. The room was pretty much completely dark, and we just kind of lay in bed, and both seemed to be staring at the ceiling. We didn't realise we were staring at the same thing. See... Crow turned to me and said, Boy, do you see that? Which I replied, Yeah. We proceeded to watch this darker than usual shadow exist, almost completely still in a normal-ish form, in the middle of the ceiling, directly above Crow. After a few minutes, the shape started morphing and moving in the same spot, changing size whilst doing so. Crow then said, It kind of looks like it's moving. At this point, we both must have been thinking we were having some differing sleep-deprived hallucinations. I then said, yeah, it's moving a bit like an octopus. It has arms. And Crow was a bit thrown, since he then confirmed that we were watching the same thing. The room was dark, but the shape was darker. Like pitch black. Like staring in a living void on the ceiling above us. When we turned the light on to see if it was a shadow reflecting off something... It wasn't. It had nothing to reflect off. There was nothing moving in the room and there was no light source to produce this shadow. When we sat up, it didn't move. It stayed there, moving violently on the spot and changing shape. I'm not even sure why we weren't even scared, just weirded out and curious. We were watching it for so long, I can't even remember how long. I can't even remember falling asleep. I finally decided to tell this dream or nightmare I had, something like five years ago. A little bit of context. Keep in mind that my grandma was already deceased by the time I dreamt the following story. And also my dad used to be very, very, way too much probably, 
invested in the paranormal at some point of his life because he wanted to contact his father that had passed away. My story must have happened somewhere around 2015. My grandma used to live with my aunt, who was a nurse who took care of her. It was, it was only the two of them all the time. They used to live in a big house in the city centre of Bordeaux, in France, and the house always felt kind of creepy. It had a second floor with marble stairs. When you got on the top of the stairs, just on your right was my grandma's bedroom. Now please keep in mind that if there ever was one place in the whole world that my siblings and I were not allowed to go in when we were young, it was our grandma's bedroom. Anyways, now let the dream begin. I'll describe how it happened through my very own perspective. I'm on the second floor and I'm just out of my aunt's bedroom, which is on the opposite side of my grandma's room. In the dream, I'm aware that my grandma is deceased and also that I'm currently alone in the house with my aunt, but I can hear her laugh. I don't understand why, and I see her just exiting my grandma's bedroom. I asked her, who are you talking to? She's holding this basket of laundry under her arm, and she answers, go and see for yourself, still laughing. I advance, and I get to the entrance of my room. I take one step inside, and I notice a presence on the right. I look right, and I see my grandpa. He died when I was five or six, so I don't have any real memory of him, sitting on the bed. The room is bright, and when I see him, I'm surprised. He's looking right in front of him, and then slowly turns his head right to look at me. When he's looking at me, he smiles at me, and I'm feeling very good. I can feel like he's protecting me, watching over me, and that he loves me, actually. But then, I sense something on my left. Remember, it all happened so fast in the dream, it all felt like it lasted 10 seconds in total. So I turn my head on the left, and there's this big closet carved inside the wall. And inside the closet, there's my grandma, standing, looking in front of her in a very blind way, I would say. But it's not my grandma as I've known her, old. She's in her mid-fifties, has brown hair and big glasses. When I see her, I'm even more surprised and scared actually, and then it happens. She turns her head and looks at me extremely quickly. Her gaze is pure evil. I can feel that she hates me. She loved me when she was alive. It's only a dream, right? Wait for it. And wants to hurt me. At the very same exact moment, there were a lot of creepy noises in the dream, like violins, untuned, just like in horror movies. At this particular moment, I am overwhelmed, completely and utterly terrified and also completely paralysed. I cannot move an inch. I'm petrified and then I woke up. But what woke me up? That's the problem. I remember perfectly what woke me up. I felt two gentle knocks or strokes on the back of my head. The second one was fainter. Awoken, I was disoriented and scared, but I fell asleep again. The time was around 2 or 3 a.m. The next day, and actually the following days, I couldn't stop thinking about the dream. It all felt so real. I was scared of going to sleep again, and I was also overthinking about the two knocks on my head that woke me up. I know I felt them. I told my dad everything, even though he never spoke of paranormal to us before, because he wanted to protect us in some way. He concluded that I had received a visit. I was visited by someone, maybe my grandma, but it's weird. Why would it turn into such a horrible nightmare? My brother Andrew is a massive skeptic. He doesn't believe in anything of the paranormal realm. He'll try to find a scientific explanation for everything. He and I share a wall between our bedrooms. So one night, I was sleeping, and I woke up to the sound of my door opening. As my door opens, I can see a shadow on the wall of something short looking. So at this point, I'm wide awake and scared to death. I try to move to get up to see what the shadow is, and I hear a voice whisper in my ear. No, 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 no. 
It was right in my ear. I was in my bed facing the wall. Any time I tried to move even my toes, it would whisper, no, 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 no. It felt like 10 minutes had passed and then I heard my door close and I was able to move again. The next morning, I was telling my brothers what had happened and Andrew goes, you're not going to like this, but I had the weirdest dream. Andrew proceeds to tell me that a little three foot tall thing comes into my room and I saw it walking around. But when I got close to my bed, I got up and tried to punch it. In the time it took me to make contact, it had disappeared. I asked him how he knew it was a dream and he said he's just thinking it was a dream because it was unexplainable. I asked him what time it was and he said when he saw the clock it was 3.30. When it finally left my room, it was 3.15. Haven't had an experience like that again, but all I know is I was wide awake and I've never been so scared of something. So I used to babysit these two boys when I was a teenager. I was with them for years and started watching them when they were three and one years old. Michael and Sam. Every time I was in that house, I'd get such a creepy vibe. I'd hear sounds all the time. So years had passed. Now they were eight and six. Typically, when I was at their house, I'd stay in the kitchen while they played in the basement. They had a TV and games, etc. Massive toys room. I heard Michael saying, you need to stop that Sally. So it did weird me out, like he was calling his brother Sally. I ignored it and just continued to listen to them because they seemed to be fine after that. About 30 minutes later, I heard someone say, oh, Michael, where did you go? I didn't know who that was, so I ran down the stairs. When I entered the game room, Sam looked at me really confused and said, Chris, what's wrong? I see Michael sitting on the couch. I look around and no one's there. So I ask Sam who was talking. If they were talking on the phone to a friend or something, Sam looks me in the eye and says, oh no, Chris, that was just Michael's friend, Sally. She comes to visit sometimes. He continued playing his game like that was a normal statement. I asked Michael who Sally was and he said, she's my friend. She likes to play with me and be silly. She's behind you waiting for me to go play. I immediately jumped around and no one was there. I got this weird feeling, and I remember just telling the boys I'd be upstairs. I ran up so fast. To this day, I hear her voice calling Michael. My house has always been pretty haunted. A man died in the 1960s in my house, and his grandchild died a couple days later in the hospital. We hear things and see things all the time. Dishes clanking as if somebody's eating or putting them away. I saw a man in the house. We've seen kids' footprints in the house. None of us are children. Today, they brought home my grandfather's ashes and instantly, I got so queasy. I've been telling them it's a bad idea to do so just because the owner of the house is here. The man I've seen in the house. He's never done anything bad. Just kind of walks around and keeps to himself and watches. The kid doesn't bother us either. She just walks around and moves things. Never been scared to stay in the house by myself until today. As soon as the ashes came home, I didn't even know it, but I could feel it. I got a really queasy feeling like I was going to throw up. And I heard my dad say, why are you bringing them here? And go bring them back to your mom's house. My grandma's staying with us, so our house is empty. That was my grandfather's favourite place, his house. She said she was going to keep them upstairs in her room. I got so nauseous, it was so weird. My family left the store and I couldn't be in the house by myself. It just felt weird that something was wrong. I don't know. Maybe the spirits just aren't okay with each other. I have no idea. All I know is I've been feeling nauseous since they came into the house. And you keep feeling like something's watching everything I do. But it's a feeling that I don't know. Like I don't know who's watching me, but usually I can tell who it feels like. What should I do? Why did this happen?
I once worked at a gas station in my town. It was nothing like you see today, where they have entire delis, row after row of snacks or anything like that. This place was old as dirt, and if we had five customers inside at once, it was packed wall to wall. I always had to work the overnight shift there, which meant watching whatever channels the antenna could pick up late at night on our tiny box TV in the corner, and smoking cigarettes behind the counter. Yeah, we could actually do that back then. My boss had an ancient desktop computer set up in the back room for our truck rental business that we ran off of the property. And I liked to sneak back there and check my MySpace and a few other sites. I could always hear the bell when a customer came in, and I had a direct line of sight to the front of the store from the desk, so it wasn't an issue. I was even allowed to take my dog with me once in a while, a little corgi. I would often hear noises in the back, but always chalked it up to my imagination because it was late at night and I was sure that I was overtired. Well, that changed when I began to bring my dog with me. I would bring him right in the back while I surfed the web and he would always lay down facing away from me. It didn't take him more than a few minutes each night to begin perking his ears up and roughing under his breath long before I began to hear anything. Once they were noises I could make out, he would be standing at attention by that point, gazing fixedly into what seemed to be thin air. The problem with taking my dog with me was that I would have to walk him, and since I didn't feel comfortable going out of the store that late at night, I only took him a few times. One of the many times he wasn't with me, I was sitting on the computer, and I heard the bell on the front door jingle. When I looked up, I saw what looked like a guy walking in, and I immediately got up to help him. I stepped into the booth and saw that he was over in the corner, at the very end of my counter. My view was obstructed by the small TV in the corner and a rather large scratch-off ticket display. So while I could see the arm and shoulder of his black jacket, I couldn't see anything more than that. I broke out into my friendly smile and said, Hello, can I help you find anything? This was in part because I'm a genuinely friendly person, and in part because many of our customers tried to steal the Slim Jims and fire of our energy bottles that were kept over there. As soon as I got done speaking, the man turned to me and my heart dropped. On his right temple, the one that was furthest away from me, was a bullet hole and blood coming out of it, running down his face in a thick, almost black line. I remember gripping the counter and my eyes filling with horror because there was no way this man should have still been standing with something like that going on. I remember his eyes were just filled with sadness and exhaustion. As I was stuttering and reaching for the phone to call 911, he just left. He literally disappeared in front of me. One minute he was there, and the next he was gone. I tried for the longest time to tell myself that I must have fallen asleep somehow and dreamed it or that it was just an imagination from my overly tired mind, but I couldn't do it. I know what I saw, and it was all in perfect clarity. After a few weeks, I eventually mentioned it vaguely to my co-worker, who relieved me each morning. I didn't want to sound insane, so I just asked if she had noticed anything strange in the store. That's when she blurted out that calling cards and gift cards often drop randomly from the display over in that corner and she hears what sounds like someone walking around when no one is in the store. I finally broke down and told her what I saw, and she laughed at me and said, it makes sense, and then went on to tell me about a murder that had happened a few decades prior. Apparently, a man pulled up to get gas, and another man saw him from the street, and thought he was someone that owed him money. He peeled into the parking lot and shot him point blank before he could even make it inside to get his gas and then sped away. He was coarse and convicted, but she thought the gentleman I saw was the spirit of the one who got shot. That place is still standing today, and still keeps me out. Just to add, I also used to hear a group of girls laughing hysterically outside, but no one was ever there. Even when I was brave enough to go out and look. Who knows what that was about. My siblings and I spent most of our time with our father, but every other weekend we went to see my mother, 
who lived with her mother. They moved around a lot, and eventually moved to a multi-family home, where we got the basement apartment. I was around 12 at the time. One of the first things I was told about the house by my grandma was that the house had been around since the Revolutionary War. People unfamiliar with New England may not know how commonplace this is, especially in the area of Connecticut I'm from. Plenty of houses around here were built in the 1600s and 1700s. Many of them have plaques on them with the year. I always felt terrified in that basement, but I didn't even think that was unusual. I never asked myself why I felt so scared all the time. I always felt like I was being watched or that there was some other presence near me. It's difficult to put into words, but at the time, being a kid, I treated it as if I were in a movie 24 seven. It felt like cameras were all over me and that there was an audience monitoring my every move, even when I slept. At the time, again, I didn't attribute this to ghosts or paranormal activity, and I really didn't have an explanation for it. I felt it the most in the bathroom. I would try to spend the least amount of time there possible, running in and running out, always thinking someone was in there. I also always had trouble falling asleep there. My brothers and I all slept in the living room, me and one brother on the pull-out couch bed, and one would sleep on an armchair in the corner. My grandma had her own bedroom and so did my mother. My mother eventually left. She sold her car and phone and went off with some man she just met, and we lost contact for years. When she left, I took over her bedroom on the nights we stayed with our grandma. Sleeping in that room was even more terrifying. I always heard scratching in the walls in my mother's old bedroom. They seemed to me to come from inside the middle of the wall between her room and the kitchen. At the time, I figured it was mice, though I had never seen or heard of mice being an issue in the apartment. The bedroom door would also open on its own, even though my family confirmed they were not opening my door. I remember before I would go to sleep, I would close it as properly as I could, pushing it hard, making sure it clicked making sure it wouldn't pull open without the doorknob twisting. And yet I would wake up with the door slightly ajar. Again at the time, my explanation was that my mother had one of those behind the door shoe racks with tons of shoes hanging off. And I figured maybe the weights would pull open the door. Well, I had never seen it happen with my own eyes and I couldn't get it to open that way myself. Finally, I went back to sleeping in the living room and never going into my mother's old bedroom. One night, I stayed up late reading using the browser on my DS. My brothers were both asleep in the room with me, and my grandma was in her bedroom with the door closed. I turned my DS off at about 2 or 3 a.m. I faced away from the kitchen, looking towards my brothers. I heard a sound that I didn't recognize. Then after a couple seconds, I heard it again. Then again. I realized it was the sound of the refrigerator door opening. I froze and strained to listen closer. I heard the fridge door open, then after about four or five full seconds, close, and then open again. This happened over and over for a few minutes. I was too terrified to turn around. I just continued laying completely still, frozen in terror. Under no circumstance would I ever have turned around to see what was opening the fridge. I eventually moved my gaze, looking more to the side. When I noticed, I could see the light emanating into my view every time the fridge opened and turning to black every time it closed. Eventually, it stopped and I passed out. In the morning, I told my grandma and brothers about what happened and confirmed that none of them were messing with the fridge. I also tested the door and it wasn't one that would just pop open. You really had to yank on it to open it. Families upstairs moved in and out and in and out. Nobody ever living there long. Eventually, even the landlord decided to live somewhere else and we were the only family living in the entire building. We decided it was time for us to move on as well. Towards the end, I went outside the hula hoop and swore I saw a shadow watching me from an upstairs window. I never went into the backyard ever again after that. I also walked around the perimeter of the huge house on my last day there and noticed on the side there was a door at the same level as our basement apartment, 
but I had no idea where it could have led, because there was no other space in our apartment that I hadn't seen, and no other doors. This door was padlocked, zip-tied, and the handle had rope and bungee cords tying it closed. The sight left me so unnerved that I ran back into our apartments immediately. When we moved out to another apartment, I noticed a different feeling immediately. I felt safe and never felt like I was being watched. That's when I decided I believed in ghosts. It happened three years ago when I was 13 years old, grade eight. I joined an English camp that summer where students from different schools stayed at a learning institution for two weeks to learn more about English. And I shared a dorm room with three other roommates. On the last day of the camp, my group decided to meet up early in the morning so we could see sunrise before our time together ends. So me and my friend woke up at around four in the morning, brushed our teeth and met up with others. We went to a nearby cliff to watch the sunrise. It was beautiful, although mosquito bites were everywhere. We didn't head back into our dorms immediately and walked around the area outside our dorms, passing a basketball court and a kind of creepy feeling church, although I believed nothing was wrong with the church. My friends stood at the basketball court to chat, where we could see our dorm room windows directly, as the court is just outside of the dormitory, but that's when I noticed something very weird. It was a pale white figure which resembled a woman, standing by the window, looking at us. I immediately called my friends to make sure I wasn't going insane, and they confirmed it was indeed there. As I looked closer and counted the windows, I realised the window belonged to my room in the girl's dorm. The white figure, which didn't move an inch, was completely faceless, yet I could feel it staring right at us. I was certain it was not any of my roommates, as that thing was way too white to be someone pretending to be a ghost. Plus my other sleeping roommates whom I know quite well will never do this sort of prank. Knowing the white figure in my room, I naturally got scared, hesitant to go back. But I had to go back since we had to pack our stuff and get ready to leave. When I pushed open the door slowly in fright with my friend, we couldn't see any abnormalities. The curtains by the window were closed, completely blocking the window view, which doesn't match up as we saw the curtains were open when the figure stood there by the window. If the curtains were not opened, then how did the white figure show up? We frantically shook our asleep roommate awake and questioned her if she knew anything or if someone entered our room. She was a light sleeper and would have woken up if she heard the door opening. She said the only time she heard the door open was when my friend and I left the room and very certain no one else has entered the room the whole time we were out. She wasn't the type of person who would pull such pranks, plus the figure did not resemble her in any way, so we firmly believed she was not behind this. The only reasonable explanation to us is something paranormal. My fourth roommate went to sleep with her friends in another room, so it couldn't have been her either. She never entered our room until 7am. But when we told her about the terrifying experience we had, she told us she experienced something weird either. She slept in the same bed as her friend, and when they woke up, their bed was wet. They know they didn't wet themselves, since their shorts and underwear were dry, and they didn't have any bottles of water in the room either. So that morning was quite an experience for all of us. Left me shocked, and well, I may believe in paranormal stuff to have some extent now, after my encounter. Similarly, my brother, who also went to the camp in the same institution three years earlier than me, told me he had the exact same thing as me when I told him I saw a ghost. He asked me if I saw the figure in the morning in the girl's dormitory, and yes, it was the same as how he described it. Pale white, faceless, encountered in the morning and lingering in the girl's dormitory. So my friends and I were not seeing things at that time. I could only assume that the white figure had been there for a long time already. Perhaps it was simply watching over us, because it never did any harm when my brother or I encountered it. <laughs>